Welcome back to the Bourbon and BS podcast, everyone. Happy Whiskey Wednesday. We've got some special guests for you tonight um, coming from Diesel Cigars. So we're excited to have them on. They are remote from Tejas, I believe, right? Is that where they're at? Texas? Texas? Yeah. <laughs> they're from Texas here tonight, coming in remotely. We're going to have them on. I just want to thank our sponsors before we get started. We're going to be uh, smoking the Diesel Whiskey Row PX Sherry Cask cigar tonight uh that is by way of our sponsor tinderbox at easton in columbus ohio i want to thank them for the featured cigar every week including this diesel whiskey row px sherry cast cigar and uh yeah i'm looking forward to learning from these guys about the these uh these different blends they've done with rabbit hole which leads me into the uh the whiskey we're gonna be doing rabbit hole derringer tonight which is the finished in px sherry cast so that's what uh, is going to pair hopefully very well together. That's the whole goal, I believe. I want to thank also uh, Altidus USA. You see behind us, Romeo Julieta, Monte Cristo, H. Upman. They have other brands, of course, a big portfolio. I want to thank Josh Bentley and Altidus USA for sponsoring us throughout the year. And then uh, tonight we have, what, the Romeo Julieta Reserve, correct? Correct. Yeah. And that's the in the Rothschild and Tubo. So. Yep. Uh, looking forward to it. That's a great cigar as well. So that's the second one that we're going to be smoking tonight. We'd love to have uh, our guests, Justin and Jonathan, in the garage. But unfortunately, we're going to have to settle for them being halfway across the country. And uh, also, I want to thank BS Cigar Company for the gold and silver and uh, the support as well. And then certainly, uh, not least, but last, unfortunately, is patreon.com slash bourbon and BS podcast. And uh, that's you guys. We had a, another new... Uh, patron recently and we appreciate that we had that big gift you can do a one-time donation uh, or contribution uh we had victoria do that and that was fantastic she, i had to walk her through again how to like get back out of it so it yeah. didn't do a, a monthly thing but you can sign it up for a monthly i know jonathan herring from forge cigars he's supported the podcast for many many months and we appreciate that he actually won one of the prizes i believe <laughs> yeah i need to get to him i think it's, i'm looking at it over there yeah but uh <laughs> Maybe, maybe we should have him pick the the number tonight if we Absolutely. do another drawing. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, thank you, Patreon.com. You can do $5, $10, or $25 a year, whatever you guys want to do. You can do one time, you can do monthly, whatever it takes, whatever you feel like. We appreciate every little bit. We uh, are going to use some of that uh, Patreon money. We're going to be hopefully heading down to Louisville, to the Bourbon Trail, uh, late June. So we're going to be uh, doing something, hopefully collaborating also again with the Bourbon and Blonde. So check that out or find out the details as we get them. But Without further ado, I want to bring these guys on. Justin Andrews and uh, Jonathan Herring. Cheers. How are you? Good, man. How are you guys doing? Good. Good. Uh, Jonathan, you are a uh, frequent guest on this show, which we appreciate. I don't know. The last time you were on, was it with Ricky or Laurel, or which time was it? I think it was a year ago with Ricky, a year ago yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. Didn't which we have him remote sometime between now and then? Maybe Sean Williams we had, but I don't Sean know if that Williams was... was on also. Yeah. Yeah. And that episode with uh, Jonathan and Laurel, I think still our second most viewed episode. Yeah, for sure. For a while, it was number one for a while. It was but, definitely yeah. because I was on. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. No, no joke. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to share it. So anyone watching live right now, I'd, I'd encourage you to, to do the same. If you guys are listening to the audio after the fact, uh, every Wednesday around 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We do live on Facebook and also on uh, YouTube. So, Justin, this is the first time you've been on. You are the, we said, the diesel brand manager. That's yeah, the, that's the it. Business yeah. Card. That's the business card title, right? Yeah, that's the uh, that's the old uh, business card that I that I never have on me. Sure. Um, <laughs> but, but, it, but it's nice to know that you guys literally had everybody else on twice. Before you got to me, so I see. I blame John. I I he said you were busy and you don't want to like deal with small time shows like this. So you know, it's kind of. I think we're on both sides of the coin here. Uh, there you go. It, no, I, I do think you. I think we did have some scheduling conflicts before, but we did. We did. But shoot, having having Ricky and Laurel and Sean on twice is not is not a bad thing. So this, I usually I'm usually a one and done kind of guy. I get on once and and uh, I wonder why and, that is. Yeah, and I don't get invited back. So we'll, we'll make the best of this. <laughs> I think oh, it's good. a PR issue. <laughs> good. All right. So, yeah, Justin, tell us a little bit about, before we get into the cigar itself, I do want to give you an opportunity. I mean, like, tell us about a little bit of your background as far as how you became the brand manager for Diesel Cigars, which I know didn't originally, it wasn't originally a, a big thing for General, now Forged, right? I mean, this is something that you guys have picked up and run with and expanded on the, what everyone knows, Diesel. And when I think of Diesel, I think of, 
originally it was mostly online AJ Fernandez type stuff. And, and then all of a sudden it comes on the general cigar portfolio. And now you guys have branched off. We can kind of get into that a little bit too with Forge, but now you're on Forge uh, portfolio. So kind of walk us through just briefly, at least, you know, where you came from as far as coming on the scene of cigars and where you're at now. Yeah, sure. So I, um, I'm from North Carolina originally and my family, uh, they're multi-generational tobacco farmers in North Carolina and Virginia. So cigarette and chewing tobacco. So I grew up around tobacco. It was just part of our, you know, everyday life. Didn't really have much to do with it. Uh, my mother kind of did a good job of like steering all of us away from, from you know, working on the family farm too much and, and, and had different aspirations. And so, uh, so I, I was very familiar with tobacco, uh, went off to college. Uh, it, was, it was during the, the recession and I had to get pretty creative looking for internships and, and, and just a little bit of part-time work. And I, I came across an ad that said, looking for a marketing student to help uh, generate ideas for a startup cigar company. And it was a, it was a Cuban physician uh, in the town where I went to school and his family had a, a cigar factory in Nicaragua. And so me being young and, and naive and being around tobacco my whole life, going to tobacco auctions, picking tobacco, doing everything that you could possibly do within that realm. I was like, well, I know tobacco. This is, you know, this is a piece of cake. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I met his name was uh, Lou Rodriguez. He's a Cuban physician, um, moved to moved to the U.S. His family brought him here when he was a he was an infant. And uh, and so we, we met at the cigar shop. I never smoked a cigar, um, had dipped, you know, playing baseball. That was about the extent of my tobacco knowledge. And I learned pretty quickly that uh, I really didn't know a whole lot about premium cigars and, <laughs> and you know, premium uh, long leaf tobacco. And, uh, but fortunately for me, I, I, I was smart enough or lucked out enough to actually bring some ideas to the interview. And apparently I was out of the 26 people that he interviewed, I was the only one that actually came with some ideas. And, uh, and really? so he gave me, he gave me the, the internship and this was in 2009. And it's funny, I was actually sharing this with Rocky Patel not too long ago. My first assignment was to basically go and copy Rocky Patel's retailer database on his <laughs> website and send samples to those guys. That I mean, that's just you know, we he knew Rocky was big and 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 Patron, and so we were we were trying to uh, to 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 mimic that. And so, long story short, we did that. Uh, had a pretty successful run for about five six years. Uh, sold that company and uh, and then went to work for General, which was. You know, it, it's it's being on the other side of the fence for sure. So it's a different uh, different aspect. And Michael Giannini at General Cigar hired me. Uh, didn't have a job title. I was just the tobacco guy. So that's kind of how I got my start with uh, with General there. I feel like you you don't have titles from what I've learned so far. <laughs> well, I don't think that they don't really know what to do with me. So yeah. that's. <laughs> I don't really think so much about you. This is great. He's making <laughs> he's making himself marketable is what he's doing. Yeah, I, I, I don't I don't fit the mold too well. So thankfully, I've I've had some uh, in the labels. I get it. So some, some leaders <laughs> that leaders that help. <laughs> yeah, some leaders that have kind of said, "Oh, we'll just let Justin go off and do his own thing." So it's been. It's what been would you good. say you do here, sir? <laughs> um, so, all right, so. That's that's a that's awesome background. I see. I didn't know all that stuff. I, we were talking before we went live here that I, I don't know much about Justin, so I'm actually really looking forward to finding out more and more about the role and 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 everything that's kind of brought you to this. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, so we're smoking the Diesel Whiskey Row PX Sherry Cask, right? Is it still called that, or do you guys rebrand it to Derringer as well? It is still the PX Sherry Cask. Okay. Um, we're a little behind Rabbit Hole uh, as far as renaming it, but that it's funny. I actually had had a conversation with the guys at rabbit hole the other day and we talked about, we should probably update it, but uh, still the same juice. They just added a different name. So yeah, it's okay. for us. It's the whiskey rose sherry cast. Okay. Okay. And this was the second, if I'm not mistaken, this is the second edition or like the, the second part of the, you had the original just diesel whiskey row, correct? Correct. And, and that was collaborated with which bottle of, of rabbit hole? So that is that is now called the uh, the Cave Hill. Okay. Is so and, and back then it was just their you know straight uh, right. Kentucky bourbon. Yeah. Um, so we launched that the original whiskey row at at the show in, in 2018. Um, we were I mean it just it, it caught us all by surprise how successful 
It was. And so it's my first show. And yeah. Yeah. So it was, we kind of, I mean, it was just, it just exceeded our wildest expectations. It was great. And uh, we immediately went out of stock because we just didn't anticipate that type of distribution and, and volume. And, uh, and so the president of our company, Regis Brosma came to me uh, in December and was basically like, we need to launch another one. And I was like, well, Regis, this thing's been sold out for six months. Like this is still new, you know? And so yeah. I, uh, I already knew I'd already planned to launch the second edition, uh, but a few years down the road, but that's how we came about the Sherry cast really unique story with both of them. Um, I don't know how much you guys know about the the process and what we've done to kind of create those cigars, but they're, they're unique and uh, we're really proud of them. So no, tell us about that a little bit. I mean, because I know that not everyone out there listening does know what you did because when I looked at it originally, you know, when you came out with the whiskey row with the, the cave Hill or what, you know, just a straight bourbon, a lot of times you, you feel like when you do that and you throw a whiskey name on there or you throw like a spirit or something like that, it's going to be infused with it. So you're going to get a lot of this, like, you know, whatever it is, you're going to get the whiskey, you're going to get the rum, you're going to get the, the cognac, or whatever it is. And I don't think that's the case here, especially with this cigar. I smoked this cigar today for the first time a little bit because we hadn't had the diesel uh, whiskey row at the tinderbox at Easton in Columbus, Ohio, um, for, for a little bit of time now. So I hadn't smoked it in a while. And then, oddly enough, when we were lining all this up, I had the uh, the spirit rep that does Rabbit Hole here in the area. He had come in. I've done other things, other uh, events with him for, like, Irish whiskeys and stuff like that. But he came in, and he's doing a Rabbit Hole event um, coming up here this month at a, another restaurant. And so he asked me, he's like, hey, can you order this in? Do you guys have this? Can you order it in? Whatever it is. So, oddly enough, we got this in literally a week ago for him and another box or two that we had gotten in to sell as well to re established on the shelf and i smoked one today and and i didn't remember what i should expect from it and i in a good I, let me say this it's going to come across wrong no matter how i say it so i'm just gonna fucking say it I, I, it was i was very pleasantly surprised so i'm going to insult a little bit in my expectations but then the the actual result was was very good it was probably because it was my poorly taking care of car stock that you were smoking <laughs> See, I, I opened up the box no, yesterday at the no. shop and smoked the first one out of the box so this wasn't from your car stock jonathan this was boxes in that's the shop. that's good because the texas heat can um wreak havoc on some of the the tobacco there but no you were you were uh you were spot on as, as much as we tried to communicate that this was not an infused cigar this is not a flavored cigar it's simply barrel finished i mean you see it in the wine industry you see it in the in the beer industry where they finish a bourbon or they finish a cab, you know, in a bourbon barrel. That that's literally what we did. But the prior to the getting the, the finished product on the shelf, the hardest part was trying to convince my partner AJ Fernandez to do it. Uh, at you know, at Cave Zaman, he hated it. He, he absolutely refused to do it. Uh, you Just know, the basically concept. told me not going to happen. And and I you know I get it because the concern was he didn't want to compromise the flavor of the tobacco. Right. He's not interested in it. And neither was I. And, and I kept trying to explain it. And, and AJ and I go way back. So it was it wasn't as, as uh, diplomatic as, as I'm going to say it. There, there were some choice words there. But basically, <laughs> he just couldn't he, he couldn't grasp the concept of how these barrels wouldn't mess up the, the, the character of the tobacco, which and I get it. Where did you get the idea from? And I'm sorry to ask a question, but like, I don't think I've ever asked this. Like, no, you can do whatever you want. I mean, that's <laughs> so, so, so AJ, this tobacco savant, and has been doing cigars forever. Like, where did you come up with this idea, knowing that it wouldn't compromise the flavor? So it actually it was one of those. It was you hear these light bulb moments, and this was literally that. I, it had nothing to do with tobacco. Uh, Cave Zamignon, the the founder and the whiskey maker of, of Rabbit Hole, uh, has has been a family friend for years, and uh, he told me he was opening up a distiller in Kentucky. Um, and after I stopped laughing. Um, I, I, I realized he was being serious and, uh, I took a trip, uh, with a buddy of mine who also works for, uh, for STG and we went out there, they were breaking ground. They just started kind of getting some of the framework up and we started tasting the juice and I, and I noticed all these, and I didn't know a whole lot about bourbon back then. I, I was a bourbon drinker, but I wasn't like an enthusiast. And, and when Kave started explaining to me that like, according to bourbon law, you can only use a barrel once. Right. And I said, so what do you do with these barrels after you use them? He said, well, we, we bust them up 
and we and we use them as firewood to toast the barrels before we start the charring process. Well, being a tobacco guy and 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 working with all of our factories, I've seen our port wine barrels in the Dominican. I've seen rum barrels in Honduras. And so literally it was that light bulb moment. And I said, what, how would I be able to get a couple of these barrels to play around some tobacco? And he's like, dude, you just tell me how many you need, we'll, you know, you can have them. And so I was all excited. I'm leaving Louisville. I'm WhatsApping AJ and AJ's like, and I'm WhatsApping in Spanish. And so I'm sure part of it was like incorrect. And he's like, just call me. And so I call him on Monday and he was, and I explained it. I was like, AJ, we can get the barrels for free and we can transport them. We can get them there. We can age tobacco. And he was like, no, I was like, no, but you don't understand. It's this new bourbon company rabbit hole. He's like a rabbit, a what? No, I'm not doing it. And, no, and, no, no. <laughs> and, and coming from the South, I try to explain people. It's, it's like convincing your 80 year old grandmother to change her recipe on fried chicken. Like it just doesn't happen. Yeah. And, and, and thankfully, uh, you know, uh, long story short, one of our consultants who discovered AJ, basically helped me with AJ's head of operations, Freddie Molina, to basically backdoor eight barrels into his factory. And AJ was mad, didn't like it. And I was like, dude, just play, just do something. And if it doesn't work, fine. Now, four years later, if you go visit AJ's factory, they'll tell you, hey guys, come around here, let me show you my barrels. So he went from not liking the idea to now claiming you know, complete ownership of it, which is great. I don't care that, as long as the cigars come out right. And we had a question here um, also, just to kind of clarification on that. Um, Ray Chester says, so they basically put the cigars in a whiskey barrel once they're produced. No, so this, this process took us about 18 months, and we started off with, with rolled cigars in the barrel. didn't work. It saturated the tobacco, made the cigars pretty much not smokable. We put the wrapper leaf in the barrels, and we stacked them up like you would in a palone. That didn't work either. Finally, we basically figured out that the binder leaf was durable and thick enough to withstand that aging process. So what we do is we only take one component of the cigar, which is the binder leaf. We age it in the bourbon barrels. And then once we pull that out, we start to roll the cigar. So as you guys know, in our industry, most binders are neutral in flavor. They're, they're just there for combustion. It's just a, a, a component of the cigar. So by aging that binder leaf, you get a unique depth of flavor just beneath the wrapper. So it, it became kind of scientific. You know, we're, we're down because none of us had ever done anything like this. So we're, we're tweaking the process. And, and ultimately, we uh, I think we're able to uh, to get it right. What is the for everyone out there? What is the breakdown of the blend? So including the binder, both the wrapper, binder and, and uh, filler combo. So what we're smoking tonight, the sherry cask because I wanted it to be very different from the original. It's a Connecticut broadleaf wrapper, Brazilian Adipadaca binder, and Nicaraguan fillers. So that, not pairing that Brazilian tobacco with the earthiness and the strength of a Connecticut broadleaf wrapper, and then adding that barrel aging process to me, creates some, some pretty good harmony there between sweet and savory, and, and a, a full, but you know, a full bodied cigar, but something that that anyone can smoke and, and it's not something that's going to overwhelm your, your palate. Yeah. It's very fine. As I do that the cigar loses a lot of the sweetness that naturally comes through by itself when you are pairing it with a whiskey. Like to me, the sweetness doesn't come through as strong. I think it, I think it depends on, on, on what the pairing is there. There's some bourbon specifically with the, with the rabbit hole that we're, we're drinking tonight that enhances those flavors. There's other other times to where it can override them, um, but for us, the with blending the cigars to pair specifically with the rabbit hole bourbon, um, and I can get into that. It it, it 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 was there to enhance it, but there's some bourbon with a little bit of a different mash build and a different grain that can kind of overpower some of the sweetness with the cigar. Let me ask you, as far as the the technicality of the, like the process, did you? And I'm sure you you answer this a lot, but I mean, did you come up with different blends before doing the aging process as far as the binder leaf did you try to pair this up with that that bottle that spirit or did you have a cigar in mind that you thought would go well with it like what is the process as far as you know trial and error as far as getting this to this point where we have finished product did you have this this blend before you actually did the 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 barrel aging of the binder leaf that you thought hey this is probably going to go well or did you just have the binder leaf concept 
And then you're like said, hey, let me try this in a couple different uh, blends that I've been working on that I think, you know, that have that that Brazilian binder that might work really well around it. So uh, so we we basically we tried all kinds of binders. We tried San Andre Mexican binder. We, we tried Nicaraguan Habano. We tried Dominican Piloto Cabana. I mean, we tried all sorts of different binders and, and, and we would then take those binders out and start that blending process. So we went through so many different variations and combinations of a blend. Once we got that blend down, then we were able to go through and start to, to pair that with the bourbon by tweaking the, the ratio of the leaves, by tweaking the placement of the leaves to kind of help it, some of the flavor and the subtlety compare with the bourbon. But we basically we had to start with the blend first and define that combination of you get the 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 aroma you get kind of that flavor that you can't detect but not again compromising the tobacco we had some really great blends that were tried and true but through that that barrel aging process it just overwhelmed it and and it didn't really have the flavor that we were looking for i remember we were sitting at churchill downs justin and i and i think it was like raining or something and he hands me this cigar and he goes, I think this is going to be the next Whiskey Row blend, but it's not, you know, aged in the barrels yet. And I almost died. It was the strongest cigar I've ever had in my life. This cigar. Yeah. That's saying something. Dude, it, it was. dramatic, but I think, you know, it's saying <laughs> it, something. I was like, this is not smokable, Justin. And that's the difference between that Justin and I, among many things. But he knew where it was going to go with the aging process, with the putting it in the barrels and all that. And he knew. Hey, this is going to be right for that down the road. Me as a novice that doesn't know what I'm talking about, I was like, nope, this isn't going to work. I would have scrapped it right then. Well, one of the one of the things we learned through the through the process was that barrel aging dilutes so much of that of that strength and that that AJ Fernandez profile that we had to really tweak it up to kind of break that barrel aging process would bring it yeah. down to medium. Otherwise, the cigars were were very very mild because it does it just it really rounds out the blend and takes the edge off. So a lot of that, a lot of that Nicaraguan pepper, that Nicaraguan spice uh, uh, gets, you know, blended in pretty well and, and becomes a little more mellow throughout that process. Yeah. We were also hot boxing in a car and we we <laughs> with poor <laughs> drinking down. That probably added to it. What were you going to say, Nate? Well, I, I like, so the box actually comes with a little insert on it. And one thing that stuck out to me yesterday when I was reading it, uh, I was reading this after I smoked it, but you sit there and say, spicy Nicaraguan Habano. <laughs> that, that's, that's the filler. But you actually specifically say it's spicy. And I was like, yep, got that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Spice. Well, and when I smoked it yesterday, as soon as I lit it up, there was just a ton of spice right off the get-go. And then very shortly thereafter, that overwhelming spice uh, mellowed out a little bit. And in, the spice then went to the retrohale. It's got a lot of spice on the retrohale, but then the flavor on the palate became more delicate. It was actually a blend. You know, you could actually tell that that aging process and that sherry cask played a role because it actually then blends everything together and makes the flavor profile more delicate on the palate once you actually get into the cigar. You 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 are so spot on. The um and 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 that really goes into the the blending process that we did. So the the original whiskey row when I when I started drinking rabbit holes bourbon the original. You know it's a young it's a young bourbon. It was only I think it was 5 years. So it starts off really hot front of the tongue and has a really long finish. Gives you that Kentucky hug. So the original whiskey row when we blended that cigar, we wanted it to start off a little more delicate, have a little bit of that sweetness, that upfront bourbon flavor. And then as the, as the cigar uh, continues to progress, more velvety, light, crisp on the palate, not something heavy. Fast forward to what you're smoking now with the sherry cask, because of the PX sherry finish of the bourbon, it starts off to me very sweet, very sweet forward, very black cherry. And so when we did the sherry cask, I wanted it to start off with a little more of a kick in the front to balance it out. Because to me, and it's just, it's just my, my, my profile, what I like, I like contrasting flavors. So with the original being hot, long finish, I wanted the cigar to be sweet, up front, crisp, clean finish. The sherry cask, I wanted to start off with a little bit of sweetness and, and kind of work or a little bit of strength 
pepper up front and then work into more of that sherry finish. Yeah. yeah. Nailed it. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, exactly. You nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great compliment. Yeah. Uh, talk to me about the marketing a little bit about this. I mean, I love the the band on it, the box. I don't have a box. I don't know if you guys have it with you or not, but very cool marketing on it. This band is uh, pretty elaborate, very, very thick band. Um, and, and again, just like, got a little bit of that gold leaf. You've got some of the subtleties with the same color as far as the, the what is it, the reddish maroon almost. Um, obviously, you guys use the same color there. You got the diesel name on it. You got the diesel logo on there. Uh, I just... It's it's pretty fantastic. It's got a little bit of that, that different as far as, you know, the different angles going on as well. I mean, are you behind the marketing on that as well? Or do you have a hand in it? Do you have a do you have a person that does it for you and then sends you some proofs? So it's it's hard to it's hard to answer that question and not sound like a like a jackass. But I <laughs> go ahead. And sound I, like they, a jackass. they uh, you know, I, I don't know if it was good or bad, but they, they give me enough rope to pretty much hang myself or be successful. So. I uh, when I pitched this idea, it, it was it was met with such uh, hostility from a logistics standpoint, from just the whole concept that they basically said, look, you're you seem to be passionate about this. You do it. And uh, and so my 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 thought was I wanted to create a box and a label that if you know, you go to a Specs or you go to a Benny's or you go to an ABC liquor and they have the cigars and in, in the, in the bottle together. There's some symmetry there. You can tell that these two products were meant to kind of live together on the shelf or at least throughout a, a promotion. And when I would do events, I would bring the bourbon with me. So it was a very specific design, which made my life easy. I basically right. mimicked their bottle, but within the box form and what I wanted. So that's why you see that slanted angle. That's why the band is, is the way it is. That's why the Pantone colors we use are the same that Rabbit Hole uses. So I really... Yeah really wanted these two to to complement each other if they were ever displayed together. Well, again, I mean, I do like that the angles of it and everything else do go along with the the angles of the the It's a lot of attention to detail. <laughs> I'm not usually uh, I'm, man, I'm <laughs> you, you guys I'm uh I'll be ready to come back on this show next <laughs> week, man. I, I, uh, I'm not I'm not a, I'm not tipped. I mean, honestly, I I'm I'm a less is more usually when it comes to cigar bands. Like I, you know, I, I talked to to Pete at Tatawahe, and, and there's you know there's a lot of cigars that I make that I wish I didn't have to put anything on. Frankly, but we know that you sometimes. have to still. But this, I was trying to. It's such a unique story, and and right, wrong, or indifferent. I was trying to put as much information on these bands to help tell that story. Um, and even if somebody says, you know, what the hell is PX Sherry Cast? Maybe they they Google. Maybe there's some discovery there, and it helps them appreciate the fact that the uh, the cigar was aged in sherry barrels. So I went against my normal philosophy of adding a big foot band and a and a big primary band, but uh, thankfully it it seems to work. And ultimately, you know, you can have all that stuff, but if the cigar doesn't smoke well, it doesn't matter. So Absolutely. it's uh, thankfully it backs it up. Absolutely. So. We know a little bit about this this whiskey. Let's let's kind of shift gears for the first part here. Again, part one is usually the cigar and the, the whiskey here. So this is the, the straight bourbon. It says finished in PX Cherry Cask. We've got uh, 93 proof on this. Talked a little bit about already. It's twice finished. Twice finished. Once in a toasted barrel and another in a char barrel. Gotcha. Gotcha. Which we talked a little bit about that when we had the uh, Old Forester 1910 on. Yeah. Um, you said you were newer, Justin, to to bourbon. What what year was that when you're finding out about all that stuff when you first? So this was back in 2016. Okay, so uh, not that yeah. long ago, really. But that was when like the bourbon boom was really going after it. That's right, and that and that's when uh, when Cave was just starting to 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 get his uh, you know the land there in, in Louisville to build the distillery and coming up with the plan. So we were kind of. I mean, as as Rabbit Hole, you know, continued to grow and and finally get into their distillery, part of that process, I was discovering more bourbon. I was really, really falling in love with the process because there's so many similarities to that oh, and, and what what we do in cigars. Um, so yeah, so this was uh, this was 2016. The cool thing about this Derringer and ultimately what made the cigar cool is they they they're correct in their story when it. Pedro Jimenez, these sherry barrels that they get, they house the, the Pedro Jimenez sherry for 20 years in Spain. And then those barrels are then transported down to Louisville 
or rabbit hole ages their 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 uh, cave hill bourbon in those sherry barrels from anywhere from six months to a year. Okay. And then once that that finished product is extracted, those sherry cast barrels then went to AJ's factory in Nicaragua. So it's a cool process for the bourbon. And then the cigars obviously reap the benefits of both the sherry being uh, housed in the cask and then also the bourbon. Real quick. I mean, I, I don't know if you mentioned it. I might have missed it or, or already forgotten. But um, how long do you, you keep that binder leaf in there? <laughs> you asked the one question you're not allowed to ask, sir. Uh, so that's that's the one thing we haven't we haven't uh, disclosed. Um, we when I say it became the process became scientific. You guys would laugh if during this you would go down. If you were to go down there, you would have seen PVC pipes coming out of the barrel. You would have seen, you know, uh, uh, cedar wrap. I mean, we were trying everything we could to get something different, but not compromise the tobacco. As I keep repeating, and and the hardest part was determining how much time do we keep, we leave the binder leaf in the barrel. So AJ made a deal with me that he wouldn't let anyone else come come try to you know, use my barrels. And I told him I wouldn't tell anybody how, how long we aged the binder. So yeah, fair trade. But he told me one time. So I <laughs> well, he one, didn't. I don't know anything. One thing that I think is cool when you, when you hear that story, I mean, you, th you think about the, the cigar, you know, as the final product. So you got barrels from Spain making their way to Kentucky and finishing Kentucky bourbon in them. Then making its way to Nicaragua, but then you're also using Connecticut broadleaf wrapper, Nicaraguan tobacco, Brazilian tobacco. So you got so this finished product is you know the result of a handful of countries all being involved in some part of the process. It's it's a beautiful thing, man. I mean, we hear this stuff all the time you know, the 300 hands and, and the amount of work it takes just to get a cigar on the shelf. And for this project, with all those moving parts, I, I, I developed some gray hair during this and I always call it my whiskey row hair because it was not only utilizing all those different tobaccos from those different countries, but just the simple fact of getting barrels from Kentucky to Nicaragua was, was a challenge in itself. So Man, it took a lot of people. And, and the cool thing is it's a celebration of all that stuff. It's a celebration of Nicaraguan tobacco, Connecticut, USA tobacco, Brazilian tobacco, you know, Connecticut whiskey. Um, and, th and then to add on top of that, sherry from Spain. So yeah. it's uh, how, how far back does this relationship between STG and General Cigars and AJ go? So AJ was, uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, the, the first cigar actually that AJ ever produced before he had his own factory, before he had his own brand was Diesel. So it, it was one of the, one of the first, well, not before, he had a very, very small factory with, with you know, I think it was four pairs. And, uh, and Alex Svensson, who's a consultant for us, and, and the former president of Cigar International, Craig Reynolds, uh, basically discovered AJ and and he kept you know they kept smoking his stuff and they gave him a shot to, to make diesel um this was back in 2000 and oh my goodness probably 2006 maybe so um at least 15 years of history yeah which is cool because i think my impression is and i don't know if this is right my impression is when we come to AJ, it's a different relationship. Maybe AJ is doing a lot with a lot of people. He's doing a lot of great things among the, you know, people in the industry, but I feel like there's this like kinship. That's kind of cool that maybe he's willing to take a chance on something wild like this, that he wouldn't with a company that would be coming to him. You're, you're spot on. I mean, there's definitely some history there to where he allows, you know, guys like me to come in and really have some opportunity to some of his best tobacco and stuff, because, he, you know, he, he's a loyalty guy. He's, he's a trust guy. And the fact that we gave him a shot all those years ago, um, he definitely has never forgotten that. He's done okay for himself. Yeah. So yeah. to answer Ray's question, Ray had a question that I feel like this is my, my – I, mean, I was uh, going to address it too, but go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, this is, this is my line of work. So Ray said, I hadn't had any of these cigars. I would have probably steered clear of them on the shelf because my only point of reference, and he says, are those horrible Maker's Mark cigars. I didn't say that. Are these a hard sell? Did, to I put it up on the screen for you. 
<laughs> I would say I would say they're not because number one, rabbit hole isn't necessarily people aren't necessarily familiar with it like they would be if you threw Wild Turkey on there, or if you threw Maker's Mark on there, or one of these major brands. Um, it's a brand that's growing. It's a brand that's doing great things. So I don't think a consumer immediately sees that and thinks whiskey. Now the consumer that does know about it, my job and the job of the store is to tell the story. Hey, this is not an infused cigar. This is not a cigar. We're spraying something on there. This is not a cigar. We're just paying for a label and using somebody else's whiskey to dip it in. This is a cigar that has a story behind it where we're collaborating and honestly, Ray, I mean, it has been a pretty damn easy sell. Like we have set record numbers with growth with this brand. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. And to answer your question, Sean, it's a damn good smoke. No, absolutely. Yeah, it's a good smoke regardless. I mean, you could have done this without, you know, collaborating with Rabbit Hole as far as the marketing. You could have just done it behind the scenes. And I think it's a fantastic cigar regardless. And then you would happen to maybe come across this, you know, pairing up one night. You're like, man, this really goes well together. Yeah. I mean, this is something that I think you guys have a, a fantastic cigar here. Uh, Go ahead. Well, the other thing I was going to say to Ray is, uh, so I, so Ray's in Vietnam. So obviously his, uh, the cigars, ava the cigars available to him are a little bit different than uh, here in the States. Um, but one of the things I was going to say to him is, you know, Perdomo. Perdomo, you know, part of their cigars are uh, aged in whiskey bar or bourbon barrels. They used to not put that and then, you know, that became a hot thing to actually put, finish tobacco in bourbon barrels. So now they put it on their labels. But before that, no one was ever smoking a Perdomo and thinking it was a flavored cigar. Right. That it was a whiskey infused cigar because it didn't taste like whiskey. It just added an element and changed the flavor uh, and complexity of that cigar. So that's the same thing uh, with what's going on with this. It's not an infused cigar. It's not going to taste like whiskey, it, right. but it changes the flavor and the profile of the cigar. And it's one of those that you could give it to someone, take the band off, give it to them, and they would have no idea that the binder of this cigar was aged in a sherry barrel. That's, that's so true. And, you know, it's funny. Uh, oftentimes... The only hint that it was barrel finished is when you first take it out of the cellophane, you get that little whiff. Uh, uh, otherwise, you're smoking a cigar that would be a really strong, full-bodied Nicaraguan cigar that very few people could handle. So now this is this is something that pretty much any palate can smoke, whether you smoke on occasion or you, or you smoke daily. And it, it's funny because we tried so hard to communicate that this was not an infused cigar. And when we first launched them, there were a few bloggers that were like, I don't taste bourbon. You know, I don't get it. This isn't infused. And I'm sitting there reading this, like banging my head against the wall going, it's not flavored. It's yeah. not infused. And they're like, I don't get any of the bourbon. And I thought it was bourbon dipped and bourbon infused. And I'm just like, oh, do I, I got to admit, I, I had the same experience the first time I smoked the uh, Camacho barrel aged. I, I was sitting there thinking that this was going to taste like a whiskey infused cigar. And it didn't. And, you know, at the time I was, I was actually disappointed because I had set my expectations for right. one particular flavor, didn't taste that, but it was still a good cigar. See, I'm the opposite. I think that this is exactly what I want when you guys are collaborating with someone and knowing like, you know, you mentioned Perdomo, you mentioned some of the other companies that don't even advertise it. You know, I mean, Camacho, I think really tried to put it out there, trying to, uh, along with some other ones, you know, grab that bourbon craze. And market it as such you guys doing it like this knowing the story but but when i'm smoking this i don't want to smoke i'm not a huge infused cigar guy so that's one of those things that yes as we said i might have left it on the shelf thinking it was right. going to have that flavor um again you guys getting the marketing out doing this whole thing that you've done with forged as well i love the fact for those that don't understand what we're talking about with forged versus general um general is is kind of like our sponsor right all this you guys general is just huge huge portfolio just so many brands. And when you have one rep coming in, trying to work with brick and mortars, trying to work with some of the, even the online retailers, there's, you get lost in the mix, you know, diesel. Again, you have an online presence as far as the name diesel, you guys bring it under the general cigar portfolio. It, it's uh, Jonathan w was a rep for general. He was our rep in the, the Midwest here. And, and it's something that when he's coming in, he has to 
put diesel, which you it's a limited portfolio at this point for diesel, and it's growing. Uh, it seems like a pretty rapid pace, which is exciting. Um, but you have to put diesel in there. Do you talk about diesel? Or do you talk about Cohiba? Do you talk about diesel or do you talk about, you know, Punch, Party, or some of these other like iconic right. brands, right? Uh, and so it's it's up to the shop, what they, the, the reps coming in there to, to talk to that that owner or the whoever's the, the buyer, right? You know, what do you think they're gonna they're gonna get? You walk in there and you've got to do you got you know we had Sean Williams on from Cohiba, which he's with General Cigars. We had Ricky Rodriguez on here with uh, you know CAO. We had Laurel, who's with you know Macanudo. We have these again more established brands as far as brick and mortar side. I love the fact that you guys have done something with this and have broken like it kind of in two where you have a general cigar rep focusing on a portfolio. And now you have, you know, Jonathan and others doing this forged cigars, which is a sister company and focusing on brands like diesel, because when you come in, now you're going to have more of a focus. You're going to have more op opportunity to get the name out there. And with this, I think what we've established here with talking about rabbit hole, uh, you know, Derringer and other ones and, and this whiskey row sherry cask, I love the fact that I think the story is going to get out there more often and, and, and more elaborately, more in detail so that this isn't going to get lost with in a, in a, in a bad way, it's going to get lost with some of the infused stuff, you know, putting this up against like a maker's mark or putting this up against some of the Gurkha, you know, um, you know, the cognac ones that are really well known or putting it even up against like CAO flavors, another general cigar one, you're going to put, you know, you don't put this in the infused. Right. Cubicle. You don't put it up against the acids. You don't put it up against any of that Drew Estate stuff, the Javas and all that stuff. I mean, this is something that is is absolutely unique, which I love. And that's why I love being able to feature it on the show. Having you on, Justin, is because I've learned a lot already about this cigar and what your intent was. Had no idea the background. And it's like once you know the background of it, you know the story and, and how involved you were in this process. And it wasn't just another – not saying there's it's not going to talk bad about anything else, but it's not just another – Hey, we're going to, you know, ride this bourbon craze and just, you know, tack a, a brand on there. Because again, like you said, Rabbit Hole is not going to be one of those biggest, you know, well-known brands across the nation, especially worldwide. So, I mean, you well, kind of took a gamble there working on that, but then you hear the story, you're like, oh, that's why they went with Rabbit Hole as opposed to some other well, well-known brands. Well, the thing, the thing that was so appealing in it, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. I, I could have worked with any number of, of bourbon companies had that been my, my goal to begin with. But, and this isn't new, like you just said, all those other brands, aging tobacco in a bourbon barrel is not new. What I feel like we've done that is new is we, we had a full blown partnership. You know, a lot of these other companies, you don't know the barrels that they age their tobacco because they're not, they're legally not allowed to tell you. Right. And so with us, with rabbit hole, the thing that really appealed to me other than Cave being a friend was that these guys are in bourbon country, they have no legacy. They're not fourth generation. They're not Brown Foreman. They're not Freddie. No, they really tried to come at this from a different angle. And I, I have to do the same thing with diesel. I'm, yeah. I'm not, you know, a Cuban legacy, third generation roller diesel. It doesn't have a name like a Partagas or a punch or, you know, anything like that. And the thing that I, that kind of inspired me to work with these guys is they were upfront that, Hey, our bourbon's been aged five years. Hey, we're doing that. Hey, we age it in sherry cask and with diesel, we're very upfront with that, that we, we kind of go against the grain, if you will, and, and, and try to keep ourselves from being like other brands in this industry. I mean, I tell my company all the time that the strength of diesel is that it's not like our other brand. It's not like Partagas. It's not like Macanudo. It's not like Cohiba. It's, it's, and, and we value that and we protect that. And right. what we're able to do to kind of take this to the next level is really partner with Rabbit Hole. I mean, I don't know if you guys have seen them, but I have whiskey barrel lighters, whiskey barrel speakers. We built a bar that was a humidor. I mean, we have whiskey stave ashtrays, all co-branded, all diesel. Yeah, that's amazing. I've not seen a lot of that, actually. We tried to create this whole, like, 360 experience. I know a guy, Steve. Yeah, <laughs> you still need to send me, by the way, that, that CAO uh, magnet or decal for that fridge, by the way. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> not happy enough. And then also the any other rabbit hole diesel stuff for my bar as well so then we'll just hey we can stage know that, eventually and they might get a little a little pack. No, we'll have to yeah and I've, I've i've still got some left so not the bar i'm saying the little, little oh no the, the ashtrays ashtray. yeah so it was a, it was a full blown no, i'm sorry steve i mean come on. <laughs> don't listen to him all right <laughs> but steve, you're talking about the porch side and i think it's kind of cool and maybe people outside the industry don't care but i i love the fact that 
we have all these brands and and just inside baseball you know you go in as a rep and you have a five page price list single space lots of brands you're focused on what's new to explain it to you guys hey this is what's coming out and then you're focused on hey how can we increase distribution in the store well right. the first thing i'm going to go for as a salesperson is hey you cool. need another macanudo in here another punch another cohiba it's been so much fun to work on some of these brands that i just have fun with uh, Diesel being one of the main ones, you get to go in a store and actually get to spend time really diving deep into the stories. And, uh, and it's something you didn't necessarily have time to do when you had so many brands. And so I think it's a great move by our company. It's probably the single biggest investment that any company's ever made in brick and mortar. We hired 13 reps all over across the country within what, a month and a half, two oh, months. Yeah, it was quick. It was quick. And uh, we hired reps that are all industry veterans that have oh, yeah, had experience yeah. that know these accounts and uh it's it's been a lot of fun and it was it was a leap you know to go i go from the most stable thing to a brand new enterprise in our company you know and it was kind of crazy but i thought this is going to be fun this is going to kind of relight some of the my old boutique days and getting in there and building a brand inside a store and it was a lot of fun it has been a lot of fun i think it's fantastic um <clears throat> as we're getting to this point here let's see where we're at um, this is a point where Jonathan, you're familiar with this and, uh, we haven't talked as much about the, the whiskey. So in your, in your ratings, I want to have you guys, uh, kind of include a little bit what your thoughts are on the, the whiskey uh, itself as well. But, uh, so Justin, this is the time where we do at the end of part one of the bourbon BS podcast is the, the rating time. So it's whiskey, cigar, and the pairing. There's going to be three ratings out of 10, 10 being the best. Okay, so you're going to basically give a 10, out of 10 whiskey rating, out of 10 cigar, and then the pairing together out of 10 for whatever reason, whatever your rating scale is. There's no right answer, obviously, but uh, we'll start with what? Well, he may think there's a right answer. Yeah, there is no right answer. Uh, I want to start with uh, Jonathan. Oh, Shannon, you want to start? All right, so Shannon's in the studio audience here. He is also smoking. He is not. He's not a contributor when I was inside, right? And I, and I want to give a disclaimer anyone no, watching I was this asking live questions to keep when, when I left and, and now we have a, another member of the studio audience, which is Tony, my dog, because I looked at the uh, camera in the room and he was about to uh, eat the bars of the uh, crate. So now he's hanging out. So if so, people see my my yeah, arm, that's I'm not, not my leg. I'm that's not, not my leg. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> it looks real weird now that you say that you didn't have to even say it. I mean, just here's. Well, we've got Jonathan's dog running running around here too. So yeah, we got we got multiple studio members. We just we have a studio member here too. Nice, nice. So Shannon, uh, he's been on the podcast and he's been in the audience a lot. He's been kind of a, a third member when uh, we don't have guests like yourself. He'll pop on and kind of tune, you know, kind of be a part of the second part a lot. But Shannon Chapman, go ahead with your uh, your ratings. So for the cigar, I first lit it up, and my eyebrows went straight up. Like man, nice little punch, you know. And I told you. Then I got the sweetness. I was like, oh, this is great. Then I took a sip of the bourbon, and the bourbon didn't taste right at first. And then as I've been smoking and going back and forth with the drink, things have been mellowing out to like a perfect balance of uh, taste. So the cigar, the most I'm, – I'm not a big retrohale guy, but I can retrohale this all day long. And – uh with the retro hell, I, get, I don't get the spice in the retro hell. I get the sweetness, like more of a sweet note. Then as I've been drinking more on the bourbon, it was real hot in the beginning compared to the cigar. But now the cigar or the bourbon has come down and they've balanced each other out completely. I've been sitting here just enjoying the crap out of the cigar. Like, nice. So what are you hell rating? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in the beginning, when I first had both, I would have said a five. But as I went on through, I'm up to about an eight, eight, five, eight, nine. That's a cigar? No. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Yeah, the cigar. Yeah, the cigar is a nine for me, 100%. Oh, okay. I well, think he was and talking then, about his pairing first. Yeah, uh, yeah I <laughs> That's was. supposed to be part three. Yeah, that was. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. So the cigar is a definite nine. I, I love the crap out of the cigar. It's, it's definitely going in the humidor. The bourbon, I thoroughly enjoy. A little hot. In the beginning, but it mellows out after you start sipping on it. It brought it down. It's a good eight. I don't give the pairing a good eight five. Nice. Yeah, nice. I, I thoroughly enjoy it. Nice. All right, Jonathan, how about yourself there? 
You're smoking and drinking the same thing we are. So go ahead with your whiskey, cigar, and uh, the pairing ratings. All right. So I'm going to do it kind of differently. I'm sorry. But normally. You, you did right. tell him that he can do what he wants. He knows yeah, that. that's true. <laughs> I mean, she didn't so, do what he wanted. He just so I'm, I've had the whiskey. Like sign up back here, you know, like this one, two, three guys. <laughs> I've had the whiskey by itself before. I've had the cigar by itself before. So I want to talk about first the two by themselves, like not. It because, you know what I'm saying? Like not with, with whiskey, drinking maybe? the other ones. Like, you know, like it says on the screen right now, like the whiskey. <laughs> So and then normally maybe the cigar, the, cigar and then maybe the pairing. I don't know. Like normally the cigar to me is about a seven. You gotta go. I was, because a seven. Here's why. <laughs> the, the the sweetness to me comes through. Write it out. The sweetness comes through pretty strong to me. And so <laughs> I the the original whiskey row, that's a nine all day. But this has always been my second favorite of the two. Normally this bourbon to me is about a seven. I think it's a good bourbon for the price. You know, price always comes in for me. For the price, I think it's a seven a seven bourbon. Now, this is my first time having them actually together like you're supposed to have them. That makes that cigar go up, that whiskey go up. Um, it pairs so well together. Now, Justin was saying the sweetness is enhanced by the bourbon. What I'm getting is the sweetness is actually taken down a hair by the bourbon, and I'm not getting quite as a punch in the face with that sweetness. So it's making me actually taste the tobacco more in the cigar, enjoy the cigar more. So with them together, the cigar's an eight, the bourbon's eight and a half, I say that pairing is a nine. So those ratings were based on doing them together, is what you're saying? Yes, right. because I've only I've always had them separately, and separately they're a whole different ball game. Um, and I've never had it with like a sherry bourbon, and that just makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I'm enjoying the hell out of it. I don't know how I feel about all these fucking sevens around here. <laughs> all right, now, now, Justin, you you, you have your fan. opportunity now to do your ratings here as the uh, creator <laughs> of the cigar and. Uh, you, got, you guys have a you guys well, scolded right I, now. I, I feel, feel like you're getting scolded right now. Unlike the, the the Russian judges in the Olympics, I, yes. I'm a ten all the way around. Only me. Yeah, I use that same <laughs> same example there. Yeah. Yeah, but no, it's um, you know, again, we all we all have our preferences. We all we all have our 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 palates. Um, obviously, I wouldn't make a cigar that I that I wasn't absolutely crazy about. So, to me, I mean, it's you know, and again, it, it sounds like I'm a homer, but Again, if anybody out there had the opportunity to make their own cigar, you want to make something that you like. Absolutely. So to me, this this cigar, you know, and again, tobacco, tobacco doesn't travel well. So it, the cool thing about the opportunity that I have to work with all these guys is I will specifically not bring some of these cigars with me because I want to smoke the cigar after it's been sitting in Jonathan's you know, truck for a month and it's Texas heat versus if I go down to South Florida versus if I go to Washington State. So there's always a variance there, but to me, to, to kind of add some context there, so I don't sound like a homer, this cigar has two of my all-time favorite tobaccos, Connecticut Broadleaf and Brazilian Adipadaca. So to me, it's like that, you know, it, it's, it's, it's perfect for my palate, what I want. For Rabbit Hole, had somebody poured this in a glass for me and, and there was no context around it, it, it's I would immediately be able to tell that it's it's a young it's a young bourbon. It, it's there's not a whole lot of complexity compared to some of the, you know, the eight, nine, 10, 15, 20 year old bourbons, obviously. But that's that's not their lane there. It's it's to me, it's kind of like it's still youthful. It's still a little little brash. It's it's up front. It's a little cocky and, and, and it hasn't quite mellowed out and, and become an adult yet. So to me, the bourbon would be around a seven. But combining the two and obviously knowing what I know and, and doing what I do, I'm able to appreciate the, 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 the pairing together. And again, it's the same thing with anybody. If, if, you, if you eat a piece of steak and, and it's like, yeah, this is good steak. But when the chef comes out and explains to you that he sous it and he used this, you know, pink Himalayan salt and it kind of helps you understand what you're tasting. And, and, and so for me, it's, you know, the cigar is a nine. The, the bourbon's a seven. The pairing's a ten. I'm, I'm happy. Love it. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Uh, Nate, how about yourself there? So on the whiskey, 
if I didn't know the price of this bottle, just the flavor, because I definitely taste that sherry finish, because I do like a sherry or a port. So I definitely taste that up front. Uh, and then you do get kind of that long, spicy, lingering finish on it. Uh, but it's got a real thick viscosity to it in the mouth uh, because of that sherry process. Um, without the price, uh, the whiskey for me is a nine. With it being an $80 bottle in the state of Ohio, might knock it down a peg to about an eight, uh, taking the price in, into consideration. Um, but for bottles that are up there in that area of price, you know, it, it's one of the better ones that I've had, I would say, because uh, I really do enjoy the flavor of it. I don't know that I'm, you know, going to be buying this bottle a whole lot just because of that $80 price tag. You know, knowing me being the the cheap ass that I am sometimes. Frugal. Yeah. Okay, frugal. There you go. Budget friendly. Um, you know, there are some guys that ask me, like, you know, favorite bottles under $25 or so. I mean, I can get some of those, you know, three or four of those bottles for the same price as this. Uh, but the flavor alone just on this bottle, I really, really enjoy. Uh, so just the flavor, you know, just the whiskey, what it is, I'm at a nine. Uh the cigar by itself, when I smoked it yesterday, it uh, it blew me away with the complexity of the smoke because, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of spice right when I first lit it up. So I was initially thinking that's how the cigar was going to be the whole time, but it wasn't. It real, very quickly uh, mellowed out, balanced out. Uh, I didn't really get much sweetness to it. I did get some earthiness, uh and then that spice that used to be right at the front of the palate then moved to the retrohale. So it's got a lot of spice on the retrohale. Um, but uh, so the cigar itself, I give a nine as well on the cigar. Beautiful. The pairing, what I really enjoy is I'm taking sure. a sip of the whiskey and then yes, taking a draw of the cigar. As you're drawing the cigar smoke in, it brings that sweetness from that sherry cask back. And so you taste more of that sweetness with the cigar, but then you still get that spice on the back end of it. And so it's a very pleasant uh, experience because they balance each other out so well and they go together so well. So on the pairing, on the pairing, I'm at least a nine and a half. Ooh, well, those are big Just commit. I, I have commit a, to a number. I have a hard. I have a hard. I have a hard. I have a nine point six. I have a. I have a hard time, you know, giving a pairing a ten. But I mean, so what does at least a um, nine and a half mean? Th I mean, this so far with everything how that many, we've had. How many decimal points do you need to go out? <laughs> <laughs> I nine point five. I, I have a hard, six eight nine. Potter. Um. I have a really hard time giving anything a 10, but as far as a pairing, this would be the closest that I would go to giving something a 10. But you're Hell not yeah. going to give it a 10. Hell yeah. Well, hang on, Justin. I have a hard time. On. I mean, commit. To, what's your answer? What's your final answer? 9.75. There, there we, we go. go. All right. Was that so hard? Jesus. Sean gave your answer down there. So 9.731496. Seven, seven, <laughs> hey, I'm gonna throw that out there. <laughs> from from the audience. Thank you, Ian. He's out there with the uh, guys. It's Sean. It's Sean. Oh, yeah. Sean. Okay. Yeah. Well, Ian's like, what, a big old man. Yeah. Friends, yeah. friends call him Sean. He's going with a uh, 9.731496543294. Pretty darn close. Very specific. Yeah, we'll go with that answer. <laughs> Sounds right. <laughs> Sounds right. Uh, Steve? So, yeah, so with the, the whiskey, um, by the way, on this, this I added a little bit more to my glass so that I could put a dash of water in it because I'm kind of with you, uh, Justin, as you know, you, I don't want to say it tastes young, but there's a little bit of that, you know, kind of burn to it. You know, there's a little bit of that where, um, you know, again, I do take price into it. So when you're you're dealing with an $80 bottle in, in the state of Ohio, I don't know what it is. What was it down Near you, eighty-five here in Texas. Yeah, and it's Great. about uh, it's about seventy-nine in North Carolina. So it's all within that eighty, eighty-five dollar range. Ohio seventy-nine ninety-nine. Yeah, that's not that's not ridiculous when it comes to the, the the bourbon industry anymore. But is it ridiculous for a five year? I mean, 
there's no, I don't know. There's no rules anymore. There's like, I mean, like everything goes for different prices. You know what I mean? Um, but it is something where eighty dollars is is not cheap. Obviously, it's not a budget bottle. It's not your even your I think average price anymore for for a bottle of bourbon is going to be in that forty to fifty dollar range, right? I'm not I'm not surprised to see even a newer one come out with a forty to fifty dollar price range, especially when they got celebrity endorsements. You've got whatever else it is. You you right. attack on the fact that you know the bourbon craze price or whatever it might be. Um, but we live in Ohio here, and we are a state. Uh, liquor control as far as that goes so the pricing is basically standard across the board um with, with that being said i like it more even more with uh with a dash of water in there because it kind of takes off that that little bit of brashness to it without the water i'd give it probably about a 7.5 which sucks i think when it comes to when someone's listening to me say that you know would you recommend it i would recommend it even though it's 80 dollars, but 7.5 because it's very very good and, and as I've gotten into the, the whiskey, it has been more and more enjoyable. The first glass, first couple sips, I was, I'd was i be disappointed if I was a normal consumer and I spent $80 on this bottle. And I'm like, what am I doing with this? Why did I spend that money? And there'd be immediate remorse as far as you know buyer's remorse on that. But as I've gotten into it a little bit more, I've really enjoyed it separately from the cigar. Adding a dash of water, which I know everyone's got a little bit of a... Uh, their own opinion on that, whether you add a dash of water, you throw an ice cube in it, you can drink it however you want, add in a dash of water, it, it raises it a, a whole point for me as far as that goes. And again, this is not my first sip, so it's not as you know scientific as far as that goes. If I went back to this bottle and did it on my first sip, first glass of whiskey of the day, you know, 9 a.m. or something like that. <laughs> uh, on a day off. No, no, but I, I, I think it, it bumps it up above eight, so eight, eight point five there. The cigar by itself, like I said earlier, I was very pleasantly surprised revisiting this cigar, Justin. Um, I'm a huge Broadleaf fan myself. I'm happy to hear that this was part of the process as far as that goes, where you were aging. When you came up with this blend, you're like, this this is probably going to be the blend. Jonathan, thank you for sharing that story, you know, when you were smoking this and, and it was a bit you know, strong when you first did it. And that just shows the aging process overall. But this is the one you went with. Uh, I agree with Nate as far as I would have not been able to tell that this was something that was collaborated with Rabbit Hole and especially the Sherry Cask. I don't get the sweetness as much as some of you guys were, were talking about. So the cigar by itself, when I revisited it today, earlier today, before we got into this podcast, before we, we cracked the bottle, I was going to give this this cigar 8.5. I think it's a solid, solid smoke. Um, what's the MSRP on this? The, uh, the Robusto is about, uh, 849. Yeah. So this is, you're, you're into this as opposed to the bottle of whiskey. This is an average price cigar in the market today. So the way it smokes on its own, I definitely give it 8.5 smoking it with this and getting into the pairing rating. I I'd say the cigar on its own in this context. I would definitely push it to a nine. So it definitely, and that, that speaks to the pairing, the pairing, I'd give it a nine as well. I think this is something that if you guys are, are if anyone listening out there, if you, you smoke cigars and you drink whiskey, this would be something cool to do with your friends is to, to kind of use this collaborated of uh, uh, effort between, you know, diesel cigars and rabbit hole whiskey and, and take full advantage of the, the partnership. Cause we get that a lot in the retail side or just even like people that know that I do the podcast or that I'm in the cigar industry. They'll ask, you know, what, what, what would I pair with a whiskey? Then comes the questions. Well, well, what do you normally smoke? What are you drinking tonight? What have you eaten today? What are you, you know, right. what are you doing? Uh, this is a, a no brainer pairing as far as that goes. So I'm not going to say it doesn't matter what you ate today, but it's something that this is something that, that really pairs well. And I think the, the collaborative effort between the two companies it really comes through in a very strong way. And I can appreciate the effort that you, Justin, put in with the people at Rabbit Hole as far as that goes. And also, we very, very uh, mildly touched on AJ Fernandez. You guys are utilizing, you know, with Diesel, one of the greatest and hottest hands in the <laughs> industry right now. And I feel like we didn't really push that, that part of it home that you, Justin, and then, you know, Jonathan, being in, as a rep of, of Forge Cigars, you have this resource, not only with a great whiskey company, not only with your, your background, Justin, but then, in my opinion, of all of this in the pairing side of it, 
it is absolutely trumped by and should not be glazed over that you're working with AJ Fernandez on this. And I love hearing the story. And I hope people that, that, that listen to this part one can appreciate this story where Justin, you went to them, went to AJ with this idea and he's like, no, no. <laughs> and, and, and fuck no. I yeah. mean, he's like, no that's some, way. That's some determination right yeah. there. And, and somehow you made it happen, uh, came to fruition. And, and I think you guys really knocked out the part. I mean, nine is, is I think, a great rating um, for the pairing. And, and again, I think the cigar being an 8.5, being an average price cigar, when you put out an eight, nine, ten dollar cigar in the market today, if you can hit a 10 rating, you may be charging too, too little. <laughs> So I, mean, I think the company tells eight, me the same thing. <laughs> yeah. So I think like 8.5, nine, nine, you know, if you have that an average price cigar, I think that you've knocked it out of the park. I think that's what you should hope for. If you can get people saying, no, this is a 10 out of 10, you you've exceeded expectations by far. And I think you guys knocked it out of the park. So thank you very much, Justin, for, for sharing the effort and, and this project with everyone, because I think you guys really did well. And there's so many moving parts. So I think the pairing rating tonight, when we do something like this, this is pretty unique for our show. And I think a lot of shows that do a lot of similar um, well, ratings. I think this is something that there's not a whole lot of times where you can take the specific relationship between the two companies and the blunders and, and the, the minds behind it. Well, I'd mentioned beforehand, before we started and you were inside, that this is the first time on 169 episodes where we've had a whiskey and a cigar that were both finished in the same barrel. Yeah. Yeah. So it's very, very unique, but it, it works out great. Yeah. That's, all, that's, nine, all nine and above on the yeah, bearings. That's, that's pretty impressive. No, you guys are, this is, uh, this is awesome. And it's, I mean, it, the, so much work and from so many people and, and all the effort, it, it, it makes it all worth it when people can kind of understand what we're trying to do and, and appreciate it. And again, it's not, you know, not every cigar is for every person, just like not every bourbon is for every person. But we really a lot of passion, a lot of time, a lot of effort to, to go in to create this finished product. And it's kind of like this thing that you you dream about and, and you kind of put it into the world and 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 you want to protect it and, and, and you want to give it the best opportunity and you want to you know, evangelize it. And so when people appreciate it, it, it really makes that effort worth it. And it just, it was, I'm humbled and honored to be able to be in between two people like Cave Zamanyan and AJ Fernandez. And then having the leadership at General Cigar to allow me to do something like this. I mean, it, it to me, it's one of those kind of once in a lifetime opportunities. And, uh, and, and our goal was, I, you know, and still is to this day, I want somebody leaving the register leaving wherever they purchase their cigar, feeling like they got the better end of that transaction. And, and, you know, there, there's money to be made. There's, there's profit to be had. And, and trust me, as, as a guy that works for a, for a publicly traded company there, you know, there, there's, there's emphasis on that as any business, we all have to make money, but I, you know, diesel has a loyal fan base out there. I call them the diesel disciples. And I, I, I never want somebody to, to pay a premium price for something and feel like they didn't get their money's worth um, out of that experience. Absolutely. No, and, and well said. Well said. Yeah. And sorry if you heard the bark behind it. We had another studio audience member come in. So <laughs> um. well, that's what's great about you know the mics and the upgraded studio is they're very directional. Well, I just want to say thank you for the ratings, and the check is in the mail. So we'll, uh... <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wasn't part of the deal, but okay. He, he's upping his Patreon. Up. <laughs> no, no, Jonathan. Thanks for the support as always. The, the um, next episode will be sponsored and brought to you by Diesel uh, Cigars. So, we love it. <laughs> love it. Uh, that being said, I do want to uh, kind of bring part one to the close. Uh, are you guys going to stay a part of part two? I assume Jonathan's usually. Yeah, for in. Might have, we're in. There you go. Perfect. Uh, so, part two tonight, we're going to be getting into. If you guys are listening live, we're going to be doing a quick intermission. We'll do a drawing here for the mm -hmm. Patreon customers. We should have Justin pick the number. We'll have Justin pick the uh, number. Um, so, yeah, we're going to be doing that. But I, before we get into that, it's going to the topic's going to be running on empty. So, you guys being on the road all the time, I feel like you might have a little bit to say about uh, running on empty, especially after this year, getting back into it in your history. But I do want to thank Tinderbox at Easton uh, for the diesel. Whiskey Row, PX Cherry Cask, obviously listen to that. Uh, also, um, listen to part one. 
Altidus USA behind us, we have uh, Romeo Julieta, Monte Cristo, H. Upman, among other brands. We have the Romeo Julieta, the uh, Reserve, Rothschild, and Tubo. So we have that coming uh, in, in part two that Nate and I are going to be smoking. I, what are you guys smoking for part two? You guys lighting up another one of these, or you, what do you got? What do you want to smoke? We can do. Let's do this. We got a couple. I um an, another project that I I worked on was our uh, Cohiba Siri M made at El Titan de Bronze. And you worked on that too. I, I oh, brought yeah. I brought Jonathan a few, and uh, he hasn't smoked one yet. So oh, we were going to light those up. Another reason I wish you guys were in the garage. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then you're going to do what? Uh, and then I've got uh, I've, I've got another one of those, and then I've also got our Diesel Delirium, which is like my personal all time favorite, which was the predecessor to the Diesel Crucible, which uh, is the limited. Be, right? So it's uh, it's it's we've got some options here. Fantastic. Um, and also, BS Cigar Company, thank you guys for the support. The gold and silver are available through Tinderbox at Easton. All Nicaraguan tobacco. The gold is all Placencia tobacco. And the uh, silver is going to be made by Eric Espinosa at the Lozona factory. So uh, check those out if you haven't already. And then also patreon.com slash bourbon BS podcast. I've already said it. We're going to do a drawing here. So anyone that's a part of the Patreon page, we're going to do a drawing. And then I do have a backup of mail order stuff that I do need to get out for the winners, <laughs> including Jonathan, I think. Yep. Uh, so we'll get those out here. Uh, I'm going to try to do next week. Jonathan won a domino set. And so, a bottle opener. Nice. So you guys can sign up patreon.com slash bourbon BS podcast, $5, $10 or $25 tiers. It's easy. We should be getting more merchandise here soon. Um, I know we say that quite a bit, but I want to thank everyone for supporting and uh, sporting the gear. If you have a, a t-shirt, definitely throw it on the bourbon and BS community page on Facebook. We've got uh, 1400 some members right now. So that's fantastic. And love all you guys and the support for, for listening and, and, uh, and keeping the conversation going. So thank you guys very much. Intermission here. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Happy Whiskey Wednesday. And thank you guys for being a part of it. Cheers. All right. All we're right. raffling off. You guys need to take a, a restroom break or anything? Yeah, I'm going to take a quick one. You need to, yeah. You need to. I just need a charger. Probably let's take this. So, so last week we did the flask. I think we got one more of those. We got the domino set. We got a lighter and then one more set of whiskey glasses. Let's do another lighter. Lighter. <laughs> so the lighter is the Romeo and Julieta Reserve Real Nicaragua. So it's that nice, deep, metallic blue. Kind of matches Nate's shirt in the studio audience, but with a little bit more uh, metallic flake in it. Um, <laughs> Ian, we are still working on your shirt because like, you know, we had to find another printer. So <laughs> working on that. <laughs> so Hopefully he wins tonight. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Well, I mean, Ian, by the time we get that, you're going to have a heck of a care package. Let me just tell you that right now. I've already said that a little bit before, but we're definitely going to have a heck of a care package. Yeah, you should for being as patient. Well, he does ride us every single week for it, but <laughs> I'm going to pull up the Patreon page so we can get this here. And Justin, we're going to have you pick the number for the page. Okay. So we'll tell you between one and whatever which number to pick. Can't no. And hopefully, hopefully you don't pick Jonathan's number because <laughs> then it'll seem like it's rigged. And you said I've got one through what? One through twenty-three. Oh, got it. All right. So what's your number? Nineteen. That was that was my my number in my baseball days. Baseball, so. yeah, I figured you were gonna pick that. All right. Wasn't that the original number picked last week, two, too? Three, four, but we thought five, it was Jonathan, six, so seven, we had eight, to pick nine, again. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Nick Fox. Nick Fox. There you go. So Nick Fox has been a supporter since. So Nick Fox, he started back in... Um, Right at the new year of 2020. So 
He uh, became a patron on uh, 1230 of 2019. Started at $5, up to the $10. And then uh, in August of last year, he upgraded to the $25 a month tier. And he has been doing it ever since. So huge supporter, Nick Fox. You got a lighter. We're going to get it out to you here. Make sure he's been a patron for 17 months. Nice. So I'm going to send him a message right now. Is he local? He's in New Jersey. New Jersey. Nice. New Jersey. Um, he actually also is a, a supporter of the BS Cigar Company, which is one of our sponsors. So uh, I'm going to communicate with Nick here and see if I don't know if he's listening tonight. He hasn't commented or anything like that. But uh, Nick, if you got if you are listening or I'm going to reach out to you, if you want to add anything to that shipment, any BS cigars, any diesel cigars, obviously, as well, uh, we'll get those out to you as well. That's awesome. Jonathan, you good now? I'm good. Anyone listening or, or part of it, make sure you share this right now on Facebook, especially that's where a lot of the traffic comes from and it, it adds to the conversation, especially in part two. You gotta pour this, just grab a glass. Um, you saw that in there. I'm just gonna grab some off the, I'll try that the uh, makers. Yeah. We're going to change bourbons up for part two. All right. I'm going to save him. Yeah, I come off of the lowest car. Mm -hmm. There are four for the bourbons. I was trying to be there. Yeah. You want to pour there? What do you want? <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> what you want? The fuck you want? <laughs> You saw what I was saying about the ratings, though. It's so hard. I think we forgot we're... to mention that this was 2017 gold medal award winner. Oh, that's good to mention. <laughs> In the intermission. <laughs> rabbit hole commented, so they're watching. Uh, Jonathan, we had a Is question. Rabbit hole commented? We had a question from Sean. Uh, Sean yeah. Anderson, is there a store locator for these cigars? We um, we do have a, our website, dieselcigars.com, and um, it's constantly getting updated, but we do have a retail locator on that website. Okay. I don't know if you saw that picture I took, Steve, of this, but the angle I took it at, that rabbit logo came out really well on the bottom. I haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen it yet. For people that don't know, it's got like this en engraved or embossed rabbit jumping in the hole, but it's sunken into the bottle. Instead yeah. of standing out, it actually recedes into the bottle. Let's see if that picture uploaded to the iCloud that I took earlier. Yeah, so we're going to do some Makers 2021 limited release. FAEO one. <laughs> you guys know all the codes, right? No, no, we do not. It's just their 2021, right? They do it every year. Yeah, they, yeah. Last year was like CR whatever, but yeah, it's it's usually usually pretty good. Razor winning. So happy about that. For those, let me see if I can share this here. Do, 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 do share screen. He was a fan of that, right? Number one. Yeah. You think he's lived up to it? Well, he's only like 26. Yeah, so he still got to the league really early. And it's rare that a college player is a number one pick. You know, like they get you in the system at 18. There's a, a picture earlier. Look at that. Hey, look at that. <laughs> That's it right there. Would you look at that? Would you look at that? He is 35 pounds, even though he looks like a giant in that picture. <laughs> he looks massive. He is not massive. He's he is 35 pounds. There's the one I took. So yeah. He's wee, but he's moving the <laughs> the cooler and everything. <laughs> Love watching Riley. Is it uh what's the temperature there? Currently it's 81 degrees, man. Y'all are hotter than us right now. Yeah, it's a little humid. <clears throat> We're in Ohio. 
What's that? Columbus. Columbus? Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right, you guys ready, for, ready for part two here? Is it working for Columbus for like a month? You guys ready? Yes, sir. I'm going to say immediately before you do part two of this uh, Romeo Julieta Reserve, I usually like this cigar a lot and does not pair as well after smoking the, the whiskey row. Do you think that cigar just kind of blew out your palate too much for this? Uh, yeah, there's a different flavor profile. Very. All right, let's do this. Welcome back to the Bourbon and BS podcast. This is episode 169, part two. We've got uh, Justin Andrews and Jonathan Herring still with us. Uh, in part one, if you guys are listening just to the audio, we uh, reviewed the Diesel Whiskey Row PX Sherry Cask and also the uh, Rabbit Hole Derringer. So if you guys uh, want to know the, the interesting collaboration between those two, listen to part one, click on that, share it, like it, review it. We appreciate all the support, but uh, definitely some high ratings with that collaborative effort. And we also want to thank Tinderbox at Easton in Columbus, Ohio, for the, the featured cigar, which was that that diesel cigar, as well as Altidus USA. Uh, we appreciate the support from Josh Bentley and everyone at Altidus USA for the uh, Bourbon BS podcast support, BS Cigar Company as well. And then we did a drawing in the intermission, if you guys are just joining us on the audio or even on the video. But Nick Fox out of New Jersey is a patron for 17 months, and we appreciate wow. his support and the love. And uh, thank you. He won a, what was it, a Romeo Julieta lighter again, the quad yeah, torch? Yeah, yeah, the quad torch. Beautiful yeah. blue. Uh, that is the Romeo y Julieta Reserva Real Nicaragua uh, blue band done on a lighter. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. So thank you, Nick, for the support, <laughs> and we'll get that out to you as soon as we can. Tonight, uh, for part two, this is kind of where we go beyond the BS. This is where our podcast is a little bit different than most, I'd say. Jonathan, you're very familiar with it. I think you're more sober than previous episodes. At, at, oh, uh, uh, yeah. What's going on? You know what? I'm, I'm getting older. You know, just maturing. It was a year. Yeah, In the last year? Well, last year I was at the beach when we did this. So what do you expect? <laughs> I mean, All right. Whatever. Are you at your house, Jonathan? Are you at your no, house? We're at, we're at my home. Justin's sleeping over. So I told Justin last night, I said, I got to wash the dishes this morning uh, because I got a friend coming over. And Justin told his girlfriend, I got to pack a bag because I'm doing a sleepover. <laughs> so our moms got together and they were all out it. So, uh, yeah. Have your mom asked my mom. Yeah. <laughs> that is so cute. Yeah. Um. Okay. In Vietnam, That's by the so way, it's 8 a.m. right now. It's 86 degrees. Ew. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, the, Vietnam. Yeah, day yeah Vietnam. I wonder what the relative humidity is, Ray. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, tonight, we're going to be uh, going over the topic, uh, running on empty. This was a topic that was brought up by Nate, which I, I absolutely love that uh, I, I had support on, <laughs> on part two coming up with the topic. Because at times, especially episode 169, I myself run on empty sometimes when it comes up with uh, doing three plus years of coming up with topics for, for part two, especially <laughs> when we dealt with 2020, where the topic was the same goddamn thing. I felt like every day of the year <laughs> or we just included, you know, incorporated 2020 into yeah, the topic every week. It, <laughs> it wasn't always the topic, but it wormed its way in there. Yeah. So um, I'm going to give Nate actually an opportunity, which is a little different for part two for why you wanted to go over this this topic tonight and then how we can, can incorporate these guys into it well i mean so i i came up with it um looking at uh some friends uh facebook posts and yeah i was seeing because i've run into this as well uh people that you know because of their job or whatever they're working multiple jobs you know they're working every single day or six days a week you know, they're putting in 60, 70 plus hours every single week. Uh, and then they finally get a day off. And what did they do during that day off? They're mowing the grass, sure they're taking the care of the garden. They're going to the grocery store. Like they're running themselves ragged even on their day off. And it makes that day off not even feel like a day off. And okay. And so, you know, over time, 
that really can wear down on you. Mm -hmm. Um, I know there was a point in my life about seven years ago where in a 14 month stretch, I had a total of seven days off. Mm -hmm. I was working two jobs and I had seven days off, uh, in total of 14 months. And that really wears on you. That's why the, that's why the gray hair came in on the beard. Um, beard got bigger by the way so. well yeah that's over the last year um uh but no it's i was just sitting there thinking like why is it that you know we run ourselves ragged and then when we finally get a day off we we f still fill that time off with other stuff like the day off is supposed to be to relax you know recharge rejuvenate you know get your you know have a day for yourself but a lot of times we just end up filling it with more stuff and it really doesn't even feel like a day off, you know? So how do we overcome that? Uh, how do, how does that, you know, the whole running on empty, like how does that impact other areas of our life, our daily life, even the mundane things? Um, and, you know, f with, uh, with Justin and Jonathan, you know, Jonathan's on the road a bunch that gets tiring. Uh, I've been there myself. Uh, Justin, you know, you, uh, kind of being the name behind diesel cigars, you know, there's gotta be a point at some point where the creativity well just kind of runs dry and, you know, how do you, you know, how do you keep going? Like, how do you find that energy to keep going or to come up with new things? And, you know, so there's multiple ways that the topic can go, but that, those were all things I was thinking of leading into this episode. All right. <clears throat> So where do you want to take it? Well, I mean, let, let's, you know, the first thing, let's start out with, you know, why is it that on, on our days off, we always feel like we have to keep doing stuff. Why don't we actually take a day off? Women. Um, Women. No, <laughs> dude, <laughs> I'm literally thinking that all the time. Look, me and him are gone all the damn time. When we have a day off, yeah. that's our time to do things with our wives. Yeah. Go to Home Depot, plant the flowers in the front. You know, pick out, we're still decorating our house. Justin's going through a house remodel right now. Like, that's our time to give them the time that they've been desperately needing for the last six days while we've been running. Reg Dude, I, I was thinking, you said, like, how do you not run on empty? Well, go single. I mean, then you could sit at home on your couch and your True. underwear all day. True. Well, but no, no one I, wants to do I was, that. Like, I mean, I'm married as well, but there are still days that I can spend my day off hanging out with my wife but that doesn't mean we're running around doing a bunch of stuff like we hang out together at home doing nothing you know that that's one thing i picked up uh, from my stepfather you know uh monday was his day off he was a pastor for 40 years uh, mondays were always his day off and he would have people like hey uh what are you doing on monday and he would go nothing and they're like yeah. oh can you come help me? He's like, no, no, you misunderstand. <laughs> I'm doing nothing. I'm literally going to it's, do that. On it's Monday. not, it's not an empty day for you to fill or for me to <laughs> fill this stuff. I'm doing nothing. Justin, how funny is we were literally talking about this today, right? Yep. Like we were talking about, you know, everybody does Sunday fun day brunch and this and that. And I was like, dude, Sunday is Brittany and I's day to sit on the damn couch and, May take the dog for a walk, go to the grocery Great. store. I'll cook a big meal, which for me is doing nothing. Like I enjoy it. Like that's yeah. my rejuvenation. I cook a big meal from scratch and work five hours on something and just smoke cigars, have a few beers, enjoy myself. So that's like my so important. I think it's all relative, right? What you do on your, your busy days, your work days, right? I mean, sometimes you know, this is something that, you know, if you're, you're a homeowner or you have to like mow the lawn, you have to do some things around the house. It's all about what you, and some people actually enjoy doing that. That right. is their sitting, watching Netflix. I mean, before recently, binging shows on Netflix on your days off, that wasn't a thing, right? Like, because right. on a, call it a Sunday, right? You know, it wasn't something that it's like, there's, there's, there's shit. I mean, unless it's like NFL season, there's shit on TV. So there was a time where it's like you you could if you had things taped on your VCR or whatever you know whatever it might be or your DVR then like you couldn't just sit down and have 
the whole fucking world on your remote, you know what I mean, on your phone. You know, there's something that it's like there is a point where your days off, you didn't have to choose between sitting on your couch and watch an entire episode or entire season or two of the office that you've seen 18 times already. You know what I mean? You're like, well, I mean, it's pretty nice outside, but I'm kind of tired. So let's see what Michael Scott's doing today. Right. I already know what he's doing in season four on episode three, <laughs> but it's like, you do that because you know, it's like you have the ability to do it anymore. It's like, do I want to mow the lawn? No, that's not my thing, but I have to. You know what I mean? So there's this this adulting thing. But you you brought it up, Jonathan. I, I'm huge on, you know, like a Sunday fun day. You know, it's something that, you know, I I would love to just go to the local pub and, you know, drink, you know, mimosas because they're on special. <laughs> I don't normally drink mimosas, but when they're $3. That's right. That's all <laughs> get my vitamin C, a little bit of champagne, feel like I'm a little bit fancy. You know what I mean? Uh, but, you know, it's something that, I think, you know, you have to, it's not filling it. I, I think that it's all about perspective. I think you get to that point where sometimes you feel overwhelmed with all the responsibilities of what you need to do on your day off. And it sometimes it'll make you crash. And I think that's the running on empty thing. I get to that point. I know a lot of people get to that point. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer that, that people will, um, they'll, they'll let themselves go too far and they truly crash. And in that process, they'll, 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 they'll react differently to people around them. They'll react differently in their job. They don't allow themselves to take vacations like you talked about. I'm, I'm guilty of that myself. But they get to a point where they're, they're going too hard, too long, and then they do run on empty. And you all know how that works. It just doesn't, it doesn't work. Well, that's where I was getting at with my intro to this. Like, uh, you know, sometimes we run ourselves uh, into the ground so much that even the most mundane things or just the, the basic daily parts of life, we sometimes overreact negatively towards because we're just so tired of everything. So all of our frustration from that bleeds into everything else. Well, I want to know with you guys, you know, <clears throat> something that I, I dealt with, especially in the last year with all the stress and everything like that, you know, I was, you know, either enjoying, you know, hang out with friends virtually or in person and it's like it goes too late in the evening and you're, you're enjoying whiskeys like we're doing tonight you're smoking cigars you're going late into the evening into the morning sometimes or you know you had more free time because you weren't on the road possibly you guys uh and then it's something that you with with your position you're doing events you're trying to socialize with people you're doing all this stuff then you have to get up and do it all over again and you're not, I assume both of you guys are not a 8 p.m., 9 p.m. Go to that's a hard bedtime for you guys. But then you also <laughs> sometimes have to be up at 8 or 9 a.m. And then I, I found myself uh, not guilty of it, but got in that routine, the running on empty. That was now I'm, I'm, I'm overcompensating. So now I got to have more caffeine in me. So I got to actually. So now it's like. I am a, a substance abuser, not in that hard drug sense, right, but it's right. something that it's like. I'm basically fueling my body with food, uh, some supplements, caffeine, alcohol, stuff like that, where it's like your typical day when we think about the, I'd say, my, what in my view, the average adult, where it's like you got the the eight to five job, you know, you come home to the kids, you, you know, you, you do your thing, all that stuff. And then by nine, 10 o'clock, maybe 11 you know, after the shows and maybe you, you tune in for the first part of Jimmy Fallon or Jimmy Kimmel or whatever it is, you know what I mean? You don't get to the late, late show, but you do the late show and then you fall asleep to the TV and then you wake up and do it all over again. This was something that that's, that's not my life. And I, I found myself going from sometimes six in the morning to about one, 2 AM, you know? So now my average sleep is, and I don't know if I assume your smiles, you can relate to some of this is that you're working on five, six hours of sleep. But on the, the tail end of that, you, you know, you maybe had too many cocktails. A lot of people listening out there, I think, to listen to the Bourbon and BS podcast, they probably can relate to that, or at least sometimes. And then the next day, you got to hit the ground running again, and you have no time to be tired, run over, or hung over, or anything like that. So now it's like, I need to have coffee. I need to have whatever it is that, that gets me going again. And then you do it all over again. And, and fast forward, two weeks later, you crash. You get that day off and, you know, you guys talking about, you know, the wives, you got to go 
you know, Jonathan did the old school thing, you know, Frank the Tank, you know, he's like, you know, I feel like we're going to go to Home Depot. <laughs> go to Home Depot, Depot I don't know, Lowe's, maybe if we got time. Check out some vinyl siding. <laughs> Dude, uh, it was so funny because like, this was our natural conversation today, right? It was, yeah. And we were talking about a couple things that we hit on. I mean, one was the, what are we doing on Sundays? That's a recuperation day. And, and we talked about kind of how we fulfill ourselves. The other thing we talked about, which I thought super relevant, is we're both extroverts. You have to be a damn extrovert in this job. I went on a golf trip this weekend to Kentucky with a couple of friends in Somerset, where I where I was living, and I went out and visited them. And I did, you know, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday, golf on Friday and Saturday. Sunday we get to breakfast and I just like don't want to see anyone. I don't want to talk to anyone. Like I need alone time and I go and sit at the airport and read and just sit there and because as an extrovert, you burn out, you've been on for three days, yeah. you burn out. And, and, and a lot of people think extroverts are just going, 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 but right. You, right. you have that burnout time and you on the road, you have to be on. This is the one chance to meet Justin. This is the one chance to talk to him. You know, we came to an event just to see you. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, no matter what you do for a living, we all face similar challenges with, with time and, and trying to invest in those, you know, the ones that we love, you know, your wife, your kids, whoever, your friends. Um, so there, there's like a commonality between all that. But one of the things that we say in this industry is there's, you know, if, if you look at my Instagram or you look at anybody's, we only post the good. <laughs> but this industry, this industry, uh, taxes are, are owed and, and this industry will take its its piece of you. And and we don't you know, a lot of times we don't discuss these things, but there's a huge sacrifice that goes into what we do from our personal lives, professional. A lot of times they, they overlap. Parents, extended family. Yeah. Yeah. And it and it's, it, you know, I for. For the better part of 10 years, I've averaged anywhere from from a, a slow year, you know, 100 days on the road to a, to a busy year, you know, 200 plus. And you miss things. You miss weddings. You miss birthdays. You miss funerals. You miss, you know, a lot of this stuff. And, you know, I'm not I'm not posting when I'm driving from Aiken, South Carolina to Duluth, Georgia, then down to, you know, South Florida, you know, you, you don't that that's the grind. That's the you, you know, you're running on coffee, you're smoking 10, 15 cigars a day, you're being on. And so one of the things that I've, you know, you try to manage is is how you come back when you come back home. And and it is tough because you're so on and 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 you're you're constantly on and we eat at nice restaurants, we do nice things, you know, occasionally and you come home and it's like I want to sit on the couch and eat a pizza and and it's hard because so many people that are looking are missing you when you come back there's that time there's that time they have to catch you up on they're their looking week. forward to that day correct correct so it's so our industry specifically i mean you guys you, you know you mentioned before you had miguel shodell on like if you talk to miguel if you talk to eric espinosa if you talk to jack had Ferrari, eric on several times too yeah. i mean yeah it's all of us it's so funny because it's you know, like when you listen to like Joe Rogan podcast and he talks about his favorite times is when he's around other comedians and they're literally doing nothing. Like there'll be multi vendor events where all of us will get together. AJ will be there. And like when it's over, it's literally mm. the five of us sitting in a room and we're just catching up because yeah. there's very few people on this planet that can relate to what we do. And so you, you really look into the, and and you can. You can confide in them. You can complain. You can go back and forth. And there's somebody there that has literally been in your shoes, that has worked 80, 100 hour weeks, that have, you know, have had shops tell you your cigars suck and you'll never make it. And, you know, also been to the thing where the, you know, the guy gets offended that you don't remember his name. And you met him one time 10 years ago. Or on the positive side of that, you have those really uh, engaging uh, uh, opportunities where people tell you, hey, you know, I, I'm a grandfather for the first time and I smoked your cigar uh, yeah. to celebrate yeah. that. Or, hey, I got married. So there's, you know, there's there's ebbs and flows and there's good and bad with all of it. But ultimately, what I've had to do, especially recently, um, is, is realize, you know, you have to take care of yourself mentally, physically, uh, spiritually. And if not, you're, you're not going to give your best self to, to the ones that you love 
and to your 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 customers out there, to your retail partners. Um, and it's hard because you you get into this this rhythm of of like you said, where you, you're up late, you're you're up late, you're up early, you're running on way more caffeine than you've ever consumed in your life, and you're smoking cigars. It's it's the the this lifestyle definitely takes its toll on you for sure. But I'll how do you recenter? Like, oh, the yeah, other side of it. Uh, Justin and I were talking today about getting back on the road. Yeah. What did we, what did we say? Oh, it's the best. It, I, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 I, you know, to go from traveling that much to not traveling at all, I You're never so thought right. I would miss it. It's, I mean, even like, you know, this, like you walk into a Marriott hotel and there's, I can't even describe it, but there's a smell to it. And, good and or it's bad or just, uh, you need good, no. good, good. Yeah, and and it's like, oh, like this vanilla or what is it? What are we? What are we doing? With? <laughs> it's just I don't know. Maybe you know it's it like is? the it's hotel. Home, it's home away from home. Yeah. It, it 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 and and there's something about we were talking about like once you do it for a while, you're addicted. There's an addictive quality to being on the road. There's an addictive quality to everyone you meet as somebody new. There's an addictive quality to going out and going to these restaurants and doing this stuff. So we were, you know, you know. <clears throat> bitch about hey we're we're tired of, of being on the road and it's tough and the, and the grind of it but once you do it man you get so used to that lifestyle and there's something to it that we both know if we were told tomorrow we couldn't travel anymore again like we wouldn't miss the hell out of it. absolutely so there's a lot of great side to it too well and, and that being said i'm not i, I do want to throw in the point too there's you know when you're in the cigar industry you're in the spirit industry um, if you're in the service industry, a lot of times it's all about perspective also, because you guys, you know, especially now getting back on the road, it, it seems like this is what's right for you guys, what you're used to the comfort thing. Right. But there's a time where it feels like a job. Everyone else looks at you guys and it's like, Oh, you guys are just like rock stars. You're on the road all the time. You know, I work in a, in, in a retail store and they're like, so what do you do all day? You smoke cigars and, and oh, you, what, what's your podcast about? I was like, Oh, well, you know, Luckily, it's become self-sustaining. And sometimes, you know, people like, you know, people that come on the show, they bring a bottle of whiskey that, you know, I wouldn't spend money on all the time, especially I can't afford it all. So like, well, what's it on? I'm like, well, we we, we smoke cigars and we drink whiskey and uh, we talk about life. And you're like, and that's your, your podcast and you smoke, you smoke cigars and sell cigars for a living. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, but they don't see the work that goes into it on I, the back end. It I, doesn't matter. It's awesome. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is, is that it doesn't matter how long you do it. You're going to have a bad day. You're going to have, it's going to become a job at some point. It doesn't mean that you're burnt out, but that's the topic at hand here is that you're running on empty sometimes because of what we're talking about. And you guys be on the road. This is a, a I want to kind of dive into this part of it as well. I think one of the times that I look at it, you run on empty a lot of times is that you, you talk about family you talk about uh you know balancing between your your professional and personal lives and how they they come to a collision sometimes there's there's a couple things i want to introduce to the conversation you guys can run with it whatever you want two one, number one would be you know there's there's when you look at like personality types and i don't know how you guys if you've done like the disc personality tests and stuff like that over the years but you have a natural personality and adapted so a lot of times the natural is what you are uh, when you're not at work, when you're you know among your people, or when you're by yourself, and then there's the adapted uh, personality, if you will, or the work side of it. When you you put to put yourself forward in a different, you you shift gears in a sense, and and most times those are not the same. So when you guys are like Jonathan, you were hitting on that that topic a little bit when you're talking about you're an extrovert, and when you're out and you're about, and Justin's out and about, you know, uh, when 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 anyone's out in their 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 professional career. Whether you're in front of people, you're on the phone or whatever it is, you're among office people. And then when you go home and you're yourself among your people or by yourself, whatever it might be, um, there's there's a there's a collision of personalities there. And so when you're burnout, when you're running on empty, that is where I think that escalates a little bit. Um, so I don't know if you guys have an opinion on that or or how th do you guys agree with that? Do you see that being something that you run into? Or well, you guys pretty consistent, us, whether you're on the road and working or or at home. I think both of us aligned a job in our life that fit our personalities. But, and I think we both got with people in our lives who are introverts. Mm -hmm. And we did that on purpose. Because when we get home, it's really nice to have that break where they want to stay in. They want to hang out. 
But introverts, just like extroverts, need the opposite. So when an introvert has been home by themselves all week, they need a little going out. They need a little, right. little, right. little fun time. We've been an extrovert all week through our work job. We need our little, we need our second side of it where we can just calm down, relax, not have to put on a show for anyone. So it, it, it is interesting. I mean, but I think our jobs align with our personalities. It does. And, and when, you, when you speak about, you know, to being on and, and, and interfacing with all these people, it, for someone like me and someone like Jonathan, it, 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 it's natural. So it's not really like a, a, I don't necessarily have to evolve my personality because generally I'm, I'm upbeat, I'm outgoing, never meet a stranger. So I think if it didn't come naturally, that it would just add more, more difficulty to the, to the job and it would make it a little harder. Whereas I enjoy that. Now I do have my moments to where it's like, Hey, I, you know, I, I need my alone time. I don't want to go off and do things, but it's, I mean, we're, we're touching on a lot of great points. I, you know, I had a, it reminded me of a story I heard, uh, I mean, years ago, it was an old guy and he said, I love fishing because I don't get to do it often. And, and <laughs> that's the thing that it's, it's hard to relate to some people when, I mean, I love cigars. I love tobacco. It's my life. It's all I've ever done, but you're taking something that's most people's hobby and turning it into your, your livelihood. Yeah, and yeah. there's a different level of stress with yeah. that. There's a different, you know, when people, and, and especially with retailers, I, I empathize with, with you guys so much because on the outset, people go, oh, what a, what a great job. You, you smoke cigars and you see your friends all day. What they don't see is, hey, if, you know, if your margins aren't right, if you have a slow month, if, you, you know, bills aren't paid or, you know, maybe there's some, there's some financial issues that come or, you know, you're, you've got five guys that are smoking this cigar every day and that company goes out of stock for six months, you know, that affects you. So there's all this inner, inner working stuff that people really don't see that there's a, there's a reality. All of us want to pay our bills. All of us want to have a happy, healthy, balanced life. And no matter what profession you're in, that that's a challenge. Well, and with this industry that, you know, like Steve alluded to, and I, I had the same kind of mindset before uh, I became a rep. Uh, years ago when I was just working retail at a cigar shop, like I had the same thing. I thought, you know, cigar reps were like rock stars and that's what I wanted to do. And I got a job doing that and people didn't see, you know, you know, you're posting pictures of cigars you're smoking, different shops you're going to people you're meeting. They don't see, you know, the six to 10 hours a day of windshield time that you're, that you're uh, spending behind the wheel. They don't see, uh, you know, that you're staying in hotel rooms every single night. Like, oh, you get to stay in a hotel. Hotels aren't that glamorous. Like, it's right. not, it's not your bed. It's not right. your pillows, your sheet, your bathroom. Like, it's, it's a strange place that you just happen to be occupying for a, a night or a couple nights. And there's, there's a lot that, you know, we don't show because we want to show the good side of it. Right. We don't necessarily want to show, the, you know, the negativity, the negative side of it. Oh, you know, but I, I would also say, you know, I, when I see a rep out on the on the road and they're telling customers, you know, along the lines of, hey, it's not what you thought it, you know, it's not what you think it is. It's it's tougher. It's this, it's that. Dude, I fucking washed pots and pans in an all you can eat buffet when I was a kid. You know, I've I've worked outside pulling gutters down like all in all, it's a pretty great job. And I work for a company that lets us stay in a decent hotel. They take care of my car. I don't have to worry about that. Like, honestly, in the whole and whole, it's it, it's great. And it's fantastic. And what I'll say is, like, so many people get in this industry, I, I, and they know cigars. They know they know tobacco. They, they know cigars more than I probably ever will. But they're, the way their brain works, a lot of them are introverts. A lot of guys that are super into cigars and that are – Cigar store guys that love cigars are a little more introverted. If you go on the road and you're an introvert and you're having to reshape your personality each time you go into that store, you're going to burn out so quickly. It takes a person that that's the, the thing they do on the back end is, yeah. is reset that personality. Because if it, if it was a struggle for me every time I had to go into a store to build up and, whew, okay, I can do this. Instead of it only being a struggle that Friday when I've been doing it for four straight days. That would be tough, and I couldn't do it. 
And I think if you have the right personality for it and you really, and I'm not saying you really love people and that you're like a better person, but you really just meeting people excites you. Um, learning new things about people is like something that motivates you. If you're that type of person, I think this job is the greatest job you can ever have because I've had jobs all over the place and I've never experienced anything that gave me yeah. this much fulfillment, this much not not looking forward to getting up in the morning and going to work. Like I look forward to it 90% of the time. I, th I think we are with, with our personality type that we're more susceptible to the crash yes. because people that, that are introverted and, and have more of a balance, they have that shut off time. They have the, Hey, at five o'clock, the, the, the work phone shuts off, you know, five o'clock on Friday, I'm not opening up my email till eight o'clock on Monday. Whereas we, we kind of push through and, and our job bleeds into, you know, I, I have bosses in Europe. I have bosses in the U S I have a factory in Central America, Latin America, all, and it's it's hard to be effective if you create such strict boundaries because you have to ha have some accessibility to be effective. And what happens is one week, to your earlier point, one week rolls into two weeks, two yeah. weeks rolls into three weeks. It's like compounding interest. And then at some point where somebody else would have noticed week one, hey, I need to back off by week four, what goes to, hey, I need one day to chill. Next thing you know, you know, you're laying in bed sick. Your immune system's depleted. You you're, you're, you, you know, your liver's hurting. You, you've smoked out, and that, and that's what I, that's what I've noticed because coming from, from my background, which is not uncommon from a lot of people, you, you know, there's not a lot of excuses. Like, you know, nobody cares. Work harder. Like that. That's the bottom right. line with a lot right. of the stuff, and that's the mentality. And you push through, and at some point, your body goes, "Fuck you." We're taking a break, whether you like it or not, and and you're done, and well, and it and and it and it sucks, but it. I think we're more susceptible to that running on E because it's almost an adrenaline pump. It's almost like, hey, there's that there's that edge that I'm going to push through. I'm going to push through this. I can run on four hours of sleep. You know, I don't get hung. All this stuff, and then at some point, your body just shuts down. And then you get over and, it. Yeah, and and it, and it just it, it affects you in a different way. You, you reminded me of like the uh, this show on the age thing, the Seinfeld episode uh, where Kramer's test driving that car. You guys ever seen seen Seinfeld? I've seen every yes. Seinfeld. Yes. Yeah. yeah, with the gas tank, you know, it's like Thelma and Louise. You know what I mean? Like going on E and and all that stuff. I mean, that's exactly what I'm thinking of. Uh, not not before you said that. I was when you were talking about that. I'm thinking of Kramer and this car yeah. salesman. And they're just like. You know, <laughs> Grab my hand. Like, I'll go farther if you will type thing. <laughs> but the important part about it, though, I do want to say, you know, and again, we, we talk about this a lot. We're not experts on this show, but when it comes to that, the one thing I will encourage everyone to do when you're doing that, when you're running through that, getting towards that that empty phase, you got to have a consistency of, of taking care of yourself. Because you'll, be, first of all, be able to bounce back faster if you if you do push yourself too far. Uh, you will be able to push yourself a little bit further. You're still going to crash. You're not invincible. So yeah, you're going to like, you brought up a great point. Your immune system is going to basically at, at some point be like, I can't keep up with this shit. You know what I mean? And we're not even going into last year on that, but it's like, if you are, you know, watching your nutrition, if you're eating, if you're drinking enough water, see some of the basics, right? right. You're not treating your, your, your body like a dumpster and just throwing in whatever you can find, you know, going through the, the, the fast food drive throughs you're not taking your vitamins, you're not, you know, taking care of yourself on that level. We've talked about on the podcast before, I'm a big believer in that, that you have to take care of yourself on a everyday basis, so that when you do happen to treat your body like it's disposable, like you have another one coming in the mail, <laughs> that, that you actually can survive that and bounce back quicker. Because that if you don't do that, that's when not only are you physically drained, now all of a sudden you're mentally drained, you're emotionally drained. You may have some some anxiety issues. You might have some some like you said, health issues when it comes down to that mental, physical, whatever it might be. You're not going to be able to bounce back at some point. That's when it all comes crashing down. Well, that that touches on one of the points I had written down. Like, how do we balance responsibilities with self care? Because like I had alluded to at the beginning of part two, you know, there are some of us that when we get a day off, we fill it with a bunch of stuff, whether it be around the house chores or spending time with significant others. Like, 
even on our even on our time away from work, we still fill it with a bunch of stuff. So how do we balance responsibilities with taking care, actually taking time to take care of yourself? I think it goes to hand in hand, right? So you have to take care of yourself like I just kind of went over. And some of the things that you talk about the responsibilities, I think there is a little bit of a, a, a self um, realization. There's a, 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 a bringing it back and, and knowing what's important to you. So I brought up earlier just a very trivial thing about mowing the lawn, right? Um, I got to do that. Uh, I don't like doing it. But I did have a, a breakthrough after all these years that you 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 have this self-realization that some of the, the tasks, like you guys were talking about with your significant others, you come home, they want to spend time with you. And there, I don't want to, I'm not associated with age, but there is a young mentality, if you will, that you, you look at it purely as a responsibility. If you look at it as a, a pure responsibility, there will, I think that that carries a little bit of, um, uh, a negative connotation. There's negative. Yeah. So there's a little bit of this regret almost building there. Like you don't want to do it. So you have to realize why are you doing it? You know, can you, can you, can you, can you refocus, recenter what you're thinking? So when I look at it now, um, and I, I looked at it earlier in life and, and then lost it, came back to it. It's like, I, ha I, I pushed myself to have this mentality that if I'm a homeowner, I should take pride in the fact that that's my lawn. Right. You know what I mean? So I'm not the greenest lawn on the block. I don't have the prettiest landscaping, but. I also, I take pride in the fact that I want to make sure that at least my neighbors aren't upset with me. Yeah. So this is a low bar here. <laughs> like you, you don't have to set it so high, over that thing. but I, I'm just looking at it as like, I have a responsibility to my, my neighbors, my, 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 if you, you know, if you're married kids and everything, like if you have kids and stuff, now you, you amp it up even further Then now you have to look at it as like, I'm setting an example for my house. You know what I mean? Like I, I, we pay the bills here. We do all this stuff. If I let this thing go to shit on my days off, if I don't take care of my home, if I don't take care of the adulting part of my life, what example am I setting forth for my, my children, for my, my wife or husband, my neighbors? Like, and then you look back at it. It's like, what am I saying about myself at this point? Like at some point you look in the mirror, I'm like, my lawn looks like shit. <laughs> <laughs> you're it, that's so I, it's funny because i you know as a uh, i'm technically well, we both are technically in that millennial age group but I, I consider us like the elders because we were still that generation that grew up without you know we, we didn't have the internet we didn't have cell phones you know all that stuff but it was funny because i saw a thing the other day that resonated with me as as a first-time homeowner as someone who's been i've been renovating a house for about eight months now and my lawn is my arch nemesis it is, it, is so? the, it is the bane of my existence because I'm spending the time, I'm working on it, and I'm looking at my neighbor's lawns. And I remember as a kid going, why is my dad obsessed with his lawn? And my dad's in our lawn going, look at our neighbor like, look at Bob. Fuck Bob planting that new whatever tree and God this and that. And it's like there's such a pride because it's almost like. Just to use some of my yard today. Yeah, dude, I've, very, I've been yeah, in that look. Yeah. And it, there's, I've been out there working my ass off on it. There's such a switch. There's such a switch in mentality when it comes to like your yard is a is a representation of yourself. It's a representation of how you keep your house, your home, right? You know, your tidiness. Bingo. And and it's funny because as a kid, you know, I remember, you know, I'd I'd, I'd have a football game on Friday night, I'd be sore as shit. My dad's waking me up on Saturday morning. I'm having to help him in the yard. Sleeping the day away, son. Yeah, and, and, and I remember going, Dad, all our neighbors have lawn services. Like, well, why don't we hire so-and-so? And he's like, I got you. What do I need yeah. him for? And <laughs> I now, made you. I, I have a lawn service. Yes, and now I was uh, the other day, I was I was working on my yard, and I was like, you know what? I can't wait to have some some you know some damn kids to get out here and help me spread this mulch and break up these leaves. <laughs> You want and to birth? Is, you want to birth some child labor? Is what I'm. That's hearing. exactly like right. Amish. <laughs> that's, ex that's exactly right. It's like, it's I, like being I, on I, the farm. I went over to my mom's the other day, and uh, the neighbor, like, she hires one of the neighbor kids to mow her lawn now at this point, right? And uh, we, were, we were talking about. I was like, man, it looks pretty good. It looks better than mine. You know, my mower. Like, I let it go too long because of my schedule, and then I said, so got that dead grass. You know, trimmings on top of the grass, which I'm embarrassed about. But I'm like, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. 
do anything about that. I'm just going to keep mowing. But I look at hers and it's so nice. And I'm like, man, I forgot how, how long it took to mow this lawn. That's a big lawn. I'm like, I'm actually happy that I have a smaller lot than you because I, I don't <laughs> even want to fucking do mine. <laughs> but I do have that, 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 that dichotomy there where it's like, I don't want to do it. But at the same time, I don't want to pay anyone to do it. Right, right, right. I don't have any kids. So it's like I, my, my options are, are quite limited. So now you have this whole thing. When we're talking about this running on empty thing, it's like sometimes I do have to drink a little bit more caffeine and be like, all right, here we go. We're going after it. And at the end of it, you, you realize I'm I'm a I'm a grown adult child. It's <laughs> you know, like, it's like you wanted to sleep on your fucking Saturday after your Friday night football game, and you're like, I don't want to go do that. I want to sleep, and then you do it, and you're like, it wasn't that bad. It went right, but you right. know what? And you I, look back at what you did, though, Justin. You probably look back at it. You probably had a little bit of like, you know, anger towards your parents. Like, hey, make me do this. And, you know, you stop and, and, you know, you piss and moan and all that stuff. But you look back at what you mowed and you're like, that looks fucking good. It's fucking good. That's, that's right. Yeah. So, so I'll be the, I'm the guy that I, I hire someone to mow my lawn. And you know what I decided though? I decided if I'm out on the road for four or five days, I want to be able to go do something with my wife on the weekends. I want yeah. to be able to come home, get some rest on Saturday, and let's go out. Let's have fun. Let me spend that time and invest that $30 that I spent in that lawn that I wouldn't be out there for two hours. And now I'm still doing my, my flower bed, and I'm still working around it and make it look nice. And there's a lot of work still involved in owning a house. Obviously, you know that. But – I, I did decide that because if I was if I was at home every day and getting home at five or six o'clock every day, yeah, I would be doing it. But at the end of the day, like I was talking to Brittany's dad and I was like, Brittany's my wife, and I was like, um, you know, I'm thinking of getting this lawnmower that I've been looking at and all this. And he goes, Jonathan, how much does the lawn cost? And I told him and he said, It's thirty dollars. He said spend that time doing something to recuperate on the weekends. He, he runs a big business. He's, he, he works hard, harder than me, but you know, for some of us that travel on the road all week and you get home, you know, you don't want to spend your whole Saturday doing that. Um, and there's other things to be done, but it's all about the priorities. It's all about yeah. what you're, what you're trying to balance. And you know what I learned, I, I was married before my first time and I made a lot of mistakes and she made a lot of mistakes. But there are a few things I picked up on that are little things that are little important things. And I was talking to Justin about it today. There are some of these little random things that I picked up on that, hey, this is where I need to place my emphasis. This is where I need to place my focus. And you talk about it being a responsibility when you get home on a Saturday to hang out. It's it's not for me. Yeah. You know, for me, I, I tell her, hey, if I need the five hours to sit there on the couch and recuperate from the week, she gives it to me. His wife's right there, by the way. So. <laughs> but then, we get, we you know get what? on here. Jonathan, take no. a breather. But then, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to go out excited. Here. I'm going to go out excited with her. Right. What do you want to do? Let's go have fun. Yeah. Let's let's do this. And it's nothing like work. It's nothing like responsibility. It's a great time. And I, I'll look forward to it. I'll look forward to it all week. That time I get to spend you, you hit on a point, though, that you learned that, right? Yes. And you worked on that. Yes. Because there was a time that you wanted to just sit on the couch and and just binge Netflix or whatever it might be and just don't. Or I would say, no, let's go do something when I didn't want to go do it. And I was miserable the whole time. She was miserable the whole time. And now I can say, hey, give me a few hours. Let me just relax this morning and then let's go have fun tonight. And I'm ready for it. There's self-realization there. I like that. Yeah. When you're spending that $30 to have someone else mow your grass, you're not just paying 30 bucks so someone else can do it you're paying 30 bucks that way you have the time to do something else basically paying a babysitter priority. Of <laughs> what'd you say steve i said you're basically paying a babysitter of your lawn yeah no you're exactly right you have date that's, night that's because problem. someone else is taking care of your kids slash lawn slash landscaping slash cleaning whatever it might be i'm a, i'm i'm on the opposite end of the spectrum i uh i bought the lawnmower and I, uh, what mile did you get? I feel like you want to talk about this. You know, I feel well, like you're I, so how, I did, how old I bought, are you, Justin? Let's let's throw it out there. How old are you? I, I bet he bought I'm a 30, Honda. What? We're, we're six months apart. Yeah, we're thirty six and thirty six. Uh, thirty six to come. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so you, you got a nice mower there, right? You you 
Well, I, I, I uh, bought it used. The, the owner of my local cigar shop was moving, sold it to me. Nice John Deere tractor. Low of, miles. Uh, low miles. Well, those they uh, measure in hours. Low hours. <laughs> or low hours. Yeah, sorry, sorry. My, yeah, low hours. Um, and what it was funny. Did you get green? <laughs> say that again? Did you get green? <laughs> did I get green? Yeah, green color. What would you get? It's uh, yellow with a little bit of green accent oh, on it. So nice. It's, nice. Uh, it, it's, it's got uh, three stations for the blade. It, the, the seat is uh, is reclining, you know, built-in cup holder, cigar How many stand. cup holders? You got one or two? Two cup holders. Are you, why do you mean two? <laughs> I thought there was only there. one option there. I was just kidding. No, one point. for his uh, water, one for the cigar ashtray. Two, two, two cup holders. So it's funny. When I, uh, when I got it and I, I mowed my lawn for the first time, it was the middle of July. I had my bandana on my cigar. Sure. I'm riding around. I send a video to AJ, and AJ goes, uh, uh, he, he said Wahido, which translation is country boy. And uh, and 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 he and then two days later he said, I was trying to call you a redneck. And uh, and I'm out there bouncing around. That's how I, that's how I translated it. <laughs> it's, 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 it was fucking great. Well, then I started traveling, and I had this 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 span in like March and April. Where I was gone like five out of seven weeks, uh, or four out of five weeks, and I came back, and the lawn was mowed, and I had mowed it prior, and I asked my girlfriend, I said, "What's uh, what's the deal with the lawn?" And she said, "There's, I, I have a really nice guy who's uh, who's helping us renovate our house, Absolutely. and he said, uh, he said, look, I also do lawn care, <laughs> lawn needs to be, clearly Justin isn't here." And she That's said, the fucking worst. And she, and and she said. Deal. She's and she and she paid him like it was like 40 bucks to mow the lawn. And I was like, but I have a tractor. This I was coming home to mow the lawn. She was like, Yeah, sure you were. <laughs> so, <laughs> you were looking so, forward to, to to putting some more hours on that tractor. You no, know, what was kind of cool though was that my father-in-law looked to me and goes, I don't think badly of you. I'm your lawn guy. Because my dad would look at me and say, I think very badly of you for doing so, this. Yeah, that's the thing, right? You know, but he looked at me and he goes, I get it. He traveled for work. He's like Dude, you're traveling. You're going. You need that. I want you to spend it with my daughter and make her not miserable. You know, like I, I want, I want you guys to be able to enjoy your weekends and have a good time. And uh, you know, like naturally, I grew up cutting. We have yeah. fucking five acres to cut. Yeah. And I grew up, and that was my job. And it better be cut when my dad got home from work, or there were gonna be problems. And I had to go to the, ride my bike to the fucking gas <laughs> station to get more gas. I mean, I grew up in all that. And I take pride in that. And it's been something that I had to release. This like so hard for me to release. Yeah. Having yeah. someone cut my grass. Like, I hate it. I hate the thought you of it. feel bougie a little bit? No, I feel like I, I feel like an asshole. I feel like a guy that <laughs> bought something <laughs> nice. I feel like the guy that bought an old car and then hired someone to come in and fix it up. That's what it feels like to me, like a, a guy that's like, oh, I'm into nice cars, but I don't know how to well, fix let them. Me, let me step in real quick. Mowing grass and fixing up cars require different levels of skill set. I agree. So, but I would never buy an old car because I have no ability to fix it up. I bought a house with a lawn and I have the ability to cut it. And I'm choosing not to use that ability. And so <laughs> it's, yeah. and so yeah. that, that bothered me. But, you know, it's something I'm kind of learning to let go of because – Hey, it makes our weekends. It makes me be able to give the time I need to to my wife. It makes me be able to be refreshed when it comes Monday morning. I need to do what I need to do. So, I mean, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. We'll see if this keeps on. But Jonathan's working for that Lawn of the Month uh, award there from well, the HOA. Well, he's getting in that, uh, you know, hey, paid support. My neighbors have told me our <laughs> flower bed has never looked better. They said they've never uh, seen a better looking flower bed. In mowing this house. lawns and, and landscaping are different, first of all. Let me. I, ask be, I, do, all yes. I do all the landscaping. I do all the landscaping. No, like you said earlier, knowing your limitations is a good thing. I, right. I was trying to do some some demo work in in the house and 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 finishing some drywall, and I was doing it very poorly. And I was like, "What the fuck am I doing? I don't know how to do this." Like, you know, the 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 kids these days go, "I know my truth," and I was like, ah, "I know I'm not good at this, so uh, so I'm done. This is." Uh, I'm wasting time here. All right, Nate. You have Nate said he has a question. I, I, I also want to just hit you guys up, but go ahead. Do you think, as we're talking about run on empty, do you think uh, we are addicted to work, whether it be our job or at the Who's home? We like us as Americans. Americans. Okay. Because in you know, 
us compared to other countries in the in the developed world, we work right. more hours a week than not the all of them. But yeah, on average, <laughs> we work more hours a week than uh, than uh, other countries. But then, like I brought up earlier, you know, even on the weekends, on our days off or whatever, like we're still working around the house and doing other stuff. Do you think we're addicted to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Justin and I have two different answers. Yeah, I. Yeah, yes, I, I, I do, and I think it's um. You, the, you pick there. your time. You, you, send, that, you send that bottle over. You guys got more left. Yeah, I, I noticed you guys were. I wish well, we were in the garage there, there, man. We'd uh, <laughs> we'd have we'd have a few more. No, I, I think it's you know. He's been drinking from, a lot tonight. Uh, he's passed out. <laughs> he's passed out next to me here, Tony over here. <laughs> He's a lightweight. Uh, Did you run with him? You saw my video. <laughs> go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh no, it's fine. I'm, I'm taking another sip myself. There you go. You can. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of that, that's a that's a multi. No, I want to hear Justin actually answer this. this. Um, he's trying to fucking avoid it. it he's trying to avoid it. I mean, it. I, I think you guys. if if you were to observe me for like, yeah, you would say he's he's a workaholic. He's addicted to work, but again, it's 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 all I know when it comes to. I've, I've had two great loves in my life. It's what it's, it's baseball and and cigars, and and I got to a pretty high level in baseball, and it was it was basically it had to be your life. It was your. I didn't even identify as a person. I was a baseball player. Right. Like it was part of my DNA. It was what I did, and every day that I wasn't working, there was somebody else working harder than I was. And and I I've never had like substance abuse issues. But when I talk to some of my friends, which there's a lot of those in our cigar community to where their their cigar shop turned into their local bar, their yeah. their their cigar con consumption replaced the whatever the other substance was. And, and they've been able to channel that in energy into productive stuff. Even if you listen to I mentioned him earlier, Joe Rogan, he was like, I channel my energy into a healthy lifestyle. And it gives me that edge. And so for me, coming from from the, the world of sports and, and, and baseball specifically, I, I only knew how to do one thing, and that was to try to outwork everybody. And so now within within my professional career, I you know, whether I was a plumber, whether I'm, you know, a, a lawyer, whatever, like I, I feel like I would be putting the same amount of effort into it. And I don't, maybe that is, you know, working too much workaholic, but it's all I know. And and I and I've had friends that have come and gone from our industry and they've applied the same work ethic no matter what industry they're in. And ours is a little more demanding than than most. But I think it's it's really based on your personality type. And and I'm not saying it's good or bad, but it, it's just there's a difference between being able to shut it off and 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 not. And I, and I think even even during covid, a lot of the research that I've read. When people started working from home, it was very difficult for people to shut it off because your computer's right there. Your office is right there versus when you have to drive to work, when you're driving home, you let it all go. You decompress and you're ready to move on mentally. So which that's maybe well, that's me, a separate. Let me ask discussion. you a question. Do you think the guys, let's just take our company, the guys who have made it to the top, the guys that are our leaders, the guys that are, are making the biggest money and making the biggest decisions. And I'm not asking about anyone specifically, but do you think they're workaholics or do you think they have the ability to shut it off and give themselves a lot of me time and, hey, I'm going to decompress by doing this? And they're giving them, do you think they're giving themselves more off time than you are? No, absolutely no. not. I, I, I don't, I have not had exposure to anyone that has achieved a high level of success in any, in any industry that was a well rounded, balanced human being. Wow. Um, whether it was in athletics, say that, say, that, say that again. I, me personally, just speaking for myself, I have I have yet to to meet anyone that has reached the top of their their field that had a well rounded personality and had a work life balance. In athletics, I mean, you hear these guys, you hear the legend, you hear Michael Jordan, you hear these people. They were not the most well rounded people. Uh, there's a quote from Kobe Bryant where he said, "My friends and my family." understand they have to have a special relationship with me to know that I'm not going to be there. And if they love me, 
they understand that this is this is what I am. This is all I can contribute. And professionally, the leadership that I've been under, there is no balance. And and this may be and I'm sure somebody has achieved this. I'm talking about from my personal perspective. I know a lot of people that are not successful that work 40 hours a week or less. I don't know anybody who is a, who has achieved a high level of success that only works 40 hours a week, whether it's in technology, whether it's an entrepreneur, whether it's starting this business or, or running multiple international businesses. They are addicted to their craft and that addiction drives them ultimately forward. And I mean, you hear it. You hear it from NFL coaches that sleep in their offices. You hear about these guys that have had multiple marriages and all these other different things. There's always a sacrifice when you're addicted to your craft from, so from, 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 my, from my exposure. So, wow. so uh, we, we're, diving, we're, well, <laughs> we're diving into the, the concept of uh, success here, right? So, um, you know, having someone that does well with their craft and you mentioned they have multiple divorces. What's what is the success level yeah. there? Well, and it, it, how do you calculate success? So and, well, and it's if you about look, like what it is. So so there's the balance there, right? So you that's talk, right. You talk about someone that you know. There's always problems, right? So there's always problems. Um, you know, someone that works you know forty hours a week uh, that is happily married, they still have problems, right? They're home. They're home too much. Like you, you guys may have realized that you 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 had you had new issues that that you didn't know were issues in the last whatever, 13 months. Right. Um, but you have these people that are very, very successful and they've, they've provided a lot of things for a lot of people, employees, customers, whatever it might be, whatever industry they're in fans, famous, whatever, whatever it is, but they've had three divorces. So when you define success, it is, a, it is a perspective thing. And I, I look at that is that sometimes Again, going back to the topic at hand that we have tonight in part two is running on empty. Sometimes when you run on empty, you you have to you have to make your choices. And sometimes I also know that when you think you're doing things for the good of people that you care about, it's right. not always translated as right. such. Right. You know, you keep busting your ass. You 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 in your mind, you're like, no, this is why I'm doing it. You guys in your industry, I'm not going to bring you two up sp specifically, but there's a lot of times when you're a traveling salesperson, when you're, you brought up professional athletes, you're traveling all the time and you're doing it. Yes. For yourself, maybe first, which is not a bad thing, but when you do it and you're saying you justify to your mind, the reason I'm on the road all the time, the reason I'm not home is because I'm trying to provide for us. And then that doesn't translate well because by doing such, you're not, you're not there. And then now you're on divorce number two or three or whatever it might be, or you, you're having arguments with me at home. I, I loved what Jonathan said that he's learned in his 36 years that when he comes home, he had to, to let go of taking care of his own grass. Yeah. And this is, I think something that when we talk about this run on empty thing, this might be the metaphor of the night is taking care of your lawn. Oh, is that's that, true. You know, you look at it, it's like, you know, Kobe Bryant, I don't think when, when, when before he passed, I don't think he probably mowed his own lawn. Nope. So it, I think it's a safe, safe bet, right? But you know that he wanted that lawn to look good for his family and for mm -hmm. everyone else looking. And I look at that as that, Jonathan, you actually taught me something tonight is that if you, if you have to, if you can, if you have the means to do it, yeah, have someone mow your lawn because, because of what you do, you're able to do that. And then also the balance is that in my mind, the true success is, is that you can come home, the lawn is mowed and you're with someone that doesn't judge you because you didn't mow the lawn right. yourself. Right. And you're like, no, I did that because now we can actually spend and some I always time together. Thought they would. And it doesn't it's matter what you're would. doing. It doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're going out, you're taking them out, you're, you're having date night or whatever. Or the fact that you don't have to mow the lawn. So if the person you're with wants to binge season two of The Office yeah. with you again for the 18th time, you're like, I really don't want to do that either. But I will. Right. And then you have the other side of the coin where some people are like, 
oh, you want to wash your office again? Yeah, I'm going to go mow the lawn. Oh, I know we have someone that did it, but I just got to make sure it's done right. So it's all about that balance there. I mean, you talk about success, Justin, and and you're right. The people at the very, very top, they are not stable. <laughs> hey, can I tell you guys about the most successful person I've ever known? Um, no. It's, 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 it's my father. <laughs> And he worked nice. 40 hours a week. He worked for the Department of Juvenile Justice. And uh, he had kids that, that he helped get out of the system. He would go to Kmart and buy them clothes and, and get them back ready for school, make sure they're going to school, get them back on track. Now, I never knew that growing up. I didn't know it until my wife came back and she works in corrections. And he started telling her stories of all the stuff he did over the years. My dad was home at 5 o'clock every day. When my dad, when it was close to him getting home, I would go outside and start shooting the basketball or throwing the baseball against the well, well house in their yard because I knew my dad would get out of the car, take off his jacket, and start playing ball with me. Yeah. And he's a father that I'll never be. If I have kids one day, I'll never, I'll never be that father. He uh, didn't go to the bars. He didn't go hang out in a cigar shop every evening. His job and his life and his priorities was getting home for his family and being the best dad in the world he could possibly be. And what I what do I do? I'm 36 years old. I talk to him two and three hours a week. When I'm on the road, I call him. How are you doing, Dad? What's going on? And you know what? My dad never made the peak of you know the State Department of Juvenile Justice. He never made president in it or whatever. But his kids both know, me and my brother both know that this guy was successful yeah. because we felt yeah, right. loved. We felt taken care of. He was at every one of my basketball games. He would go on the road when I had sports. He was always in the stands while other people's dads were off working during the week and off doing their thing. And dude, and maybe, you know, I haven't necessarily taken after that in my career choice, but what I do know is like his success level is incredible. And you know what? Like five years ago, I was sitting with him and I said, dad, I just want to let you know, like, I would not trade a million dollars in my bank account right now that you could have passed down to me for what I have with you growing up. Yeah. Knowing yeah. you were there for me anytime and every time and going to my practices and going to my games and being there every minute of the time. Like I knew you were always going to be there. Like I would yeah. trade a million dollars in my account and he worked 40 hours a week. Yeah. And to me, he's the most successful person Why, I've ever known. Yeah. And I, I think that that was to the earlier point of how do you measure success? And and to your father that, you know, he was probably in the most successful person he knew as well because he had that time there. So I think that's the, that's the core of it is is what are your priorities? How do you measure success? Um, it's uh it's I know we, we've come we kind of gone full circle from are yeah, we working with Alex yeah. or not? But I think I, th I think there is, you know, again, there's if if your priority and your success level is is happy, healthy, family availability and influence, that that you know ultimately that could be the the highest measure of success is 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 the legacy that you leave behind versus other people maybe they're chasing a certain thing or or like do you leave that imprint on the major league baseball world do you leave that imprint right. on on nba do you leave that imprint in the cigar industry do you leave that imprint in your family it's where do you want to leave that imprint when you're done well, your I, dad yeah. left that imprint yeah. like yeah. they go and do that film for him every year he yeah. left that imprint in little league baseball in columbus ohio yeah. it's an incredible imprint where do you want to leave your imprint well, thank you for saying that. I mean, that, that's the whole thing is that that's a I, t shirt right there. Yeah, where you Dude, that's good. Imprint? Where do you want to leave your imprint? I yeah, like I, that. Where do you want to leave your imprint? And and uh, do you mow your own lawn? That's <laughs> that's a good metaphor right there. I, I look at it, and, and one of the things I've actually thought about a lot in the, the recent uh, months and year is, um, you know, again, you talk about balance, Justin, is, is, is something that you can do all the things and, and be the big success story that everyone that you've never met cares about. But the people that you've met, the people that are in your, your immediate circle, what's their, what's their, what's their story? Right. Right. So 
I think we're in a day and age anymore that, you know, it's like this whole thing where you want to like help all these strangers in your life and you work your ass off to do that, to just be, to, to help strangers, which there's nothing wrong with it. But as soon as you sacrifice the people that are in your, your family or your immediate circle, and you don't talk to these people anymore because you, you were just that adamant about the fact that I am going to exhaust myself for whatever cause it might Best be stranger to smoke the cigar at his wedding. Yeah. 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 You're, you're going to exhaust yourself to, 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 to help all these strangers. <laughs> right. Right. And in the meantime, you're neglecting all the people that you actually fucking know. There is a balance there that you can do both, but you have to have a, a head on a swivel that you actually are looking back and forth between my home base and also the people that I like the cause or the people that I want to help out. But at some point, you you have to 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 get them both in check. Right, right. It, it it's true. I, it, you know, and you guys, have, you, you've heard it too. When people say, as you get older, your your circle gets smaller, and I, and I don't think it's necessarily by choice, but I think it's you look at it and you go, hey, I, I've got a list of people, whether that's family members, significant others, or friends that I don't even have enough time to invest in those. Why am I going to invest in expanding my circle of people that right. can, you know, receive this energy? And and it, and it is it, it, you know, the older you get, the 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 more busy your schedule gets, the more demanding life gets. You you look at and there's I'm sure there's if we went down the list, there's whether it's grandparents or, or cousins or siblings or or college roommates. There's a lot of people that we wish we had more time to yeah. to invest in, and unfortunately, sometimes life gets in the way of that. And, and, and I'm guilty of it that I, you know, there's a lot of people that I meet and there, there could be a relationship there. And it's like, I don't even have time to invest in the people that I genuinely love that have been, you know, with me from, from day one. And so it's like, if I don't have the time to invest in them, I don't have the time to start bringing new people into my circle because again, it's just, there's only so many hours of the day. And and again, it's all in what you what you invest your time, your energy into, and what your priorities are. Did I called my eighty four year old grandfather last week, and just how are you doing, buddy? What's going on? And he said, "Oh, it's not Father's Day, and you're calling me." <laughs> and dude, that stuck like a dagger in my heart. That's I a mean, precedent that you set, apparently. <laughs> exactly. And what he, you know, and I, and I pride myself as being someone who cares about my family and takes time for them. And he said that to me, and he wasn't trying to be mean. He was making a joke. Yeah. But damn, I mean, but you know what? I talked to Justin this week. I talked to my friend Sean this week. I, I went to Kentucky and visited my friends this weekend. I had time for all of them. I have time for my grandfather. I mean, and where do, where do I want to leave the imprint? Right, right. Well, I, me, per, me, me personally, I would have much more time for my grandparents if, if I wasn't doing cigar podcasts and shows all the time. So no, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you're. I mean, I don't feel guilty about that. That's on <laughs> you. Me. Got you guys have a good model here. We we uh you 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 open us up in hour one and the bourbon's flowing. And then hour two, Jonathan's over here. Who's you know, crying? Who's crying first? Who's crying first tonight? <laughs> yeah, Jonathan's reflecting on life decisions, and this is uh, that's the intervention for you, Justin. You, that's what this is. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, don't let your girlfriend listen to hour two. Oh, I'm sure she's like, uh, Oprah has nothing on you guys. You guys are just pull, you're pulling at the. You the saying this, this is such different a than most question. cigar podcasts you've been on? <laughs> I told him. I told him it's nothing like any other podcast you've been on. I said, hour one, it's all fun, and we talk about blends and all this. And hour two, you start crying, and you're laying in the corner of your bedroom that night, you know, wondering about <laughs> Well, and, and it started with some, such an uh, uh, innocuous, un, un, unassuming question of, are we workaholics? And next thing, you know, Jonathan's about to go call his grandfather here in, in a couple minutes. No, I, I've already scheduled it. I've already scheduled already it. Already Monday. <laughs> Every Monday, I'm calling him. You, from you, now guys, on. You, guys are, you guys are good at what you do. I appreciate that. <laughs> and that being said, <laughs> we are going to, and you guys need to share the shit out of this, by the way, get all the diesel smokers out there uh, listening to this. Like, <laughs> they can actually hear the inside of the, the diesel people. There you go. Not just the cigars. Um, we should probably do some closing comments. This is, this is where, uh, Justin, you haven't been on this and 
Jonathan, before you start, you know, really talking about your grandfather, and I, you can you can do it if you want to. I know it's it's actually a pretty impactful thing that I've had that. You know, more recently, <clears throat> I, I want to comment real quick. You know, Jonathan, you and I have talked uh, personally because we we've developed that relationship oh, yeah. over the over the years. You know, I, I went through it, Justin. You don't know this about me. I went through a breakup, and it's one of those things that um, during that time, you know, I, I got closer with my mom. And it was it was one of those things that, you know, she's on her own after my dad passed. And when this all happened uh, over the last probably six months, her and I have talked more in the, in the last six months than we did in the last 10 years. And, you know, to speak to Jonathan's point, you know, it's one of those things she didn't she didn't call me out like Jonathan's grandfather did. <laughs> He's an asshole. Like, oh, it's Tuesday. Like, why are you calling me? No, it was just like we had this open dialogue now. And it, it, it's a nice thing that I think that a lot of people, when 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 tragedy or, or crisis hits, you start yes. reaching out to people that you took for granted. Right. right. You just knew they'd always be there and all that stuff. So now you develop that. So I hope, Jonathan, you you actually continue to. to uh, oh, there's no question. He, yeah. he stuck me. Yeah. You, you cultivate that relationship again. And I think it'd be great. So closing remarks, uh, Justin, where we based on topic. And part two of the podcast, this is when you actually give your kind of summary. You can bring up new points. You can summarize your your, your points that you've already hit. Um, and, and that being said, I'm going to put it on, on on Jonathan first so, to give example of closing remarks because he's a pro. He's been on this podcast before. I don't know. I, I, think, I think that we all kind of have a little more to reflect on after this. I, I, I do think that, like, I think we all look at someone else and I look at Justin and say, dude, you're working your ass off. Like, make sure you're taking time for the things that are important. He might look at me and say, Hey, get your fucking work life under, <laughs> under control. Um, but I, I think, and I hate to say what I said earlier, but where do, where do we want to leave our imprint? You know, do we yeah. want to have the people in our life remembering, Hey, he was always there for me and he did his best for me. Do we want to leave our imprint? In the cigar industry, and do we want to say, hey, we were a legend in that industry and we blew it up, or do we want to leave our imprint um, in business, where whatever business we're in? Um, and I think you can leave your imprint in multiple places, but I think at the end of the day, um, we got to keep those close to us close, and we have to make sure we're taking care of them in a way that's not a responsibility, but a way that we want to do it and a way that they, they want it to be done. Um, and I think we learned that through time and through age. And if we're, if we're shielding ourselves from that, if we're saying, Hey, I'm focused on this and whatever goes by the wayside, I think that's going to be a problem. I think we have to open ourselves up to changing and adapting because often, you know, our ways of doing things three years ago is not the way to do things today. And, uh, I hope I keep learning. I hope Steve keeps learning and Nate keeps learning and Justin keeps learning. I hope we all just, keep learning, evolving and making ourselves into better versions of ourselves. You know, that's still pretty to... much it. Absolutely. I like that. Nate, how about you? You're not going to go to Justin? No, you first. Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> you threw me off there. Um, yeah. you no, know, someone had, uh, someone had texted me a, a comment. Maybe think about this for my closing remark. What is your time worth? And so when we were talking about uh, the example of, you know, cutting grass versus paying someone else to cut the grass, you're using that time that you're not doing it to spend time doing something else, to spend time with your loved ones. Or you, even if you don't have someone, a significant other, you still have time to spend it with you. You know, how much, how much would you pay to have time off? to focus on yourself, you know, and, 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 you know, if, if you could, if you could take a day off of work, even if you weren't getting paid for it because you needed it, would you still take it? Like some people would probably like, yeah, cause I, I need to take time for myself or I need to get away. Even if I don't get paid for it, it's worth it because the money I'm not making is worth me taking care of myself or taking care of someone else. Um, and, uh, I think it comes down to finding what's really important to you, you know, focusing on yourself, focusing on your household, 
or are you just focusing on doing something? And I, I think the issue we run into is, you know, we want to spend, we think we have to spend all of our time doing so many other things or even taking care of so many other people that we neglect taking time for ourselves. Uh, because even, even in a relationship, the time that you're not at work doing your job and you're focusing all your off work time on someone else, you're still neglecting time for yourself. So even not, so even spending time on someone else, you're still not spending time on you and that can still wear you down. And unfortunately when that happens, we see so many, uh, the little things then start to get to us because we just have, we have no patience, no time, no energy to deal with anything else. So every little thing becomes an inconvenience. And I think it's important to get things into perspective. You know, what, what is the most important thing? Like my, my household's the most important thing. So why, so what do I do to take care of that? Well, I work a lot, but if you, if you don't take care of yourself and you're not in a right mindset and you're not uh, in a right health point, yeah. then it's hard to take care of someone else if you can't even take care of you. Because if if you're not in a position to take care of you, then eventually you'll get to the point where you're not in a position to take care of anybody, let alone yourself. And so I, I think it's important to when you get the time to actually focus on you because, and we kind of talked a little bit about it uh, yeah. a while back when we did the give and take episode. Yeah. Like there has to come a time if you're always giving, 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 you have to take time to take. And sometimes that's just taking for you. And sometimes that's just, you know, doing nothing or just doing whatever it takes to get you recentered, refocused, re-energized or whatever it may be, uh, you know, to, find out what is the most important thing for you and take care of that. Gotcha. Justin, how about you? What's, what's your closing remarks to everyone out there? Yeah. I mean, uh, you guys all have provided a really great perspective uh, when it comes to that, uh, to all the topics we've, we've discussed. And uh, Nate, to your point, man, it's, you know, we, in the industry, we all, we all joke about the cigar 50. So it seems like there's a lot of us that have gained, I mean, I'm, I'm probably 60 pounds from my, my playing weight back in a ball. And you, you get into this routine of work, work, work. And, and, you know, your obligations change, your responsibilities change. And one of the things that I've, I've kind of tried to recalibrate during COVID was, you know, even if you just take 30 minutes or an hour every day to focus on yourself, whether it's to go for a walk, go for a jog, go hit the gym, you know, meditate, whatever, whatever your thing is, it can still make that that last four to five hours of your workday that much more productive because you're mentally fresh, you're physically fresh. And I think that ties into our thing about, you know, if you don't take care of yourself, you know, how can you take care of others and, and vice versa? Yeah. I had a psychology teacher tell me in college, he said, there's got to be a me before there's a we. And as a kid, that didn't really resonate with me. And the older I've gotten, I was like, you know, that was that's a pretty profound statement because if you don't take care of yourself, if you don't understand your limitations, your own mental well-being, physical well-being, you're not going to be the best partner. You're not going to be the best and and partner in any aspect, partner in 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 a relationship, partner in business, or even a coworker. You know, whatever that case may be. Um, and another thing, you know. It, there's so much information out there and, and there's, there's so many things that we, whether it's an echo chamber and, and, and we, we fall in our little segment and we're constantly bouncing ideas and information off of people that think exactly like we do, or you expand that to conflicting thoughts. There's so much information. I, I try to absorb a lot of it. And one of the things that kind of impacted me during COVID because, you know, and we didn't touch on that during this year, but or during this episode, but that year was, was a challenge for everybody, no matter where you fall on the, on the spectrum, economic scale or, or, or anything. It was, it was a, it was something that nobody that I know has experienced that within our lifetime to where, yeah. 
the world shut down and your way of life changed. And some of us had it better than others. Thankfully, people were still smoking cigars and, 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 and drinking. But, you know, I have friends in the services, I have friends in the service industry that went from bouncers to bartenders to managers to owners and their bars were shut down for eight months, nine months. And right. it's like these guys had, you know, this impacted them in a way. Same thing where if you had a family member that was impacted negatively with COVID. And I and I, I saw this thing and I, I, I don't recall who the, who, the guy, who the speaker was, but he said a sick man wants one thing. Health. A healthy man wants a thousand things. And that resonated with me because all of us are, are, are whether it's climbing the corporate ladder or whether it's trying to, to grow our business or our brand or, or trying to do things. We want so many things, but we have the luxury of having that ambition and, and those desires because we have our health. And whereas if you don't have your health, none of that other stuff matters. None of it matters. The, the sick, the, the unhealthy, the, the cancer patient, they want one thing. They want to be healthy. And so for me personally, that impacted me because it was like it, it and it humbled me because there's so many things in this life that we take for granted. And health is one of them. And it goes back to your whole topic tonight, running on E, all these things. It's like we take this stuff for granted that our body will respond, our brain will respond, and we're pushing through things and we're working harder and, and we're spreading ourselves thin. And a sick person doesn't have those those luxuries. They're their number one objective when they wake up today is to try to be healthier. And, and so for me, that created a, a, a really good perspective of, of being appreciative of not one health, but two, your support group, your support network, yeah, yeah. The, the people who love you and support you, no matter who that is. And so it really put things in perspective, especially in a year where we have so many people that were affected negatively through health and then it also shed light to a lot of people that you know hey you know you should probably prioritize your health before a pandemic comes before this thing happens you know and and like you said before vitamins even even 30 minutes of sunlight a day you know and and so much as a society we focus on the cure for something rather than preventative measures and and i feel like if we focus more on uh, you know, a healthy lifestyle, whether that's exercise, diet, uh, engaging with people in a different level. And so I think this this kind of grounded a lot of us within the last, you know, eight to 15 months on prioritizing not only relationships, but prioritizing your health, prioritizing, you know, what what it is that you want out of life and to not take things for granted. So for me, it, it's just it, it. One, I've I've enjoyed this uh, this opportunity to be on your show. This was uh, definitely something I wasn't uh, prepared for, but <laughs> it was uh, it was it's it's you know all of us can take something from every little thing, and I hope I hope that whoever's listening and and they they take a little bit of what we've all discussed tonight, and maybe we all apply that to our daily lives, and and ultimately we wake up tomorrow. Maybe maybe someone with a with a new ambition, uh, a, a a new routine, a hangover, or, yeah, or or even even in Jonathan's case, uh, a a new routine of of contacting a, a loved one, yeah. and yeah. and so it, it it definitely this year was it, it given the opportunity which none of us wanted, none of us wanted this, but it get, gave us all the opportunity to reflect and to prioritize and realize that. You can't really take a lot of this stuff for granted, whether it's your your livelihood or or your health, for that matter. All right, so so thank you for sharing that, Justin. Um, you're absolutely right. People need to hear this, so I hope that you share this on the Diesel and your personal pages because I think this is an insight into who you are as a person. First of all, which is is beyond uh, people buy from people they like. Right. So so this is something you, you weren't prepared for this. And I, I hope that this is something that, you know, when you're not on stage, you're not like putting your yourself out there as Justin Andrews, you know, like I'm the diesel guy or whatever it might be. Like this is someone that they want to get to know because I, I've been very impressed myself. Uh, I'm sure people listening have been very impressed that this is someone that is passionate about tobacco and the cigars that you, you, you the projects that you do. And then all of a sudden, oh, surprise, there's a real person behind there. 
this is this is where you get to know the people you brought up like kobe bryant and michael jordan it's like as you get to know them more you're like i actually respect them a whole lot more after i knew more about them. have you guys ever as i get into my closing remarks have you guys ever like run your car down to the gas light on uh, now I'm, I'm not even saying the new cars that say low range i'm saying the gas light is on that you're beyond the the low range. It's now. I uh, throw my odometer on when the light comes on, so I now have forty miles left. How do you feel about that? I feel good about it. So you're crazy. I'm, getting, I'm, Justin, I'm doing you? the have fast you gas that? stops and everyone else. Justin, have you ever had that before? Where you uh, said where you're saying like when you get down to to E, how how do you feel about that? Yeah. Uh, Drive you your know. Car. <laughs> I, I'm I'm an odd bird, as my uh, my a lot of my Cuban partners would say. So I think that uh, innately there's 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 something that you either push through or or you recalibrate and you change. And so I'm I, talking I about your the, car. Oh, the car. Yeah, you run your car to eat. How do you feel? Yeah, not great. I, the I, light, I, light comes on. Yeah, not not great. It's uh, a little bit it, of anxiety. It, I, I try to I get like gas. It's it's tank. I, I don't like the, I don't like I don't like to play. You know, you say beat the clock. I don't like to play beat the uh, beat the tank. odometer there because like Jonathan's car, mine will say you know five miles, seven miles, and usually I'm somewhere in between a gas station in my hometown, and it's like, well, I know this gas station is three and a half miles, so I, I hope technology doesn't doesn't fill me there. <laughs> You go real easy on the gas. Yeah, you start you're... feathering the pedal yeah, a little yeah. bit. Yeah. I oh, oh you, you turn off the AC. Dude, I you post, shut off the I, radio. I posted <laughs> into a station the other day. It was my <laughs> best move ever. Dude, I was at 36 miles, and it went it went done. I'm on the interstate. I coasted down the interstate ramp into a gas station, landed at the pump, and I was like, I did it the most perfect way it's ever been done. Well, I don't know if you guys – if you guys noticed, we had a gas shortage in North Carolina, and it, it was we it, it was we it was artificial. There there was no gas shortage, but when I, I I it's so funny. I was one of those people that I was coming back from another state, and instead of going to the gas station at four thirty in the morning, like I was told, I went the next day at like noon, and I'm waiting in line for an hour. And I swear to God, we we you know it's like uh, what do they talk about? It, it's um, Survival of the fittest, the uh, 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 survival of the fittest, and evolution. And I saw these people filling like the most ridiculous containers with gas. Oh, I saw, I saw it. <laughs> and on I'm like, you're the problem. I got it. I got it. There's no shortage. You're just like the person who went and bought 15 cases of toilet paper during COVID. Absolutely. And I'm like sitting there livid. And then, and, and a fight broke out at the pump. And there's people cutting line. And I was like, guys. If you just filled up your tank, this wouldn't be a problem. But instead, you're filling up trash bags. I saw a farmer trash bags. Oh, oh, oh! Yeah, I think, well, that was yeah. I saw that online where they were like double bagging trash bags. But I had there was a local farmer who had this container that you usually fill for like uh, your reservoir of diesel fuel for your tractor, and it was like 120 gallons. And he's just sitting there with the pump, and I'm like. You're the asshole that's going to make the rest of us not get gas. Oh, you're preparing for the apocalypse, which is not going to happen here. So, so this this being on E thing is is a touchy subject for me tonight. All right, all right. So, so yes. Scale it back. You you actually proved my point. If you are running on empty in life, you're doing something wrong. That's that that's my whole thing. Yeah. We've all been there. We've all been exhausted. We've all put ourselves out there way too much. We've always put others first. We've always done things for other people first. We've sometimes been selfish and we've put ourselves like, you know, uh, Justin, you, you talked about, you know, these these super successful people at the top of their game. And that's where, you're like, you know, you went through whatever like that person went through family breakups, three divorces. They've done whatever. Yes, there is a little bit of admiration for what they've succeeded in doing. But if you're running on E, especially consistently, that should be a a a a a, a light on your fuel gauge. Yeah. You're doing something wrong. Like you gotta keep fueling your tank. 
I feel attacked. But but not like what'd you say, Jonathan? I feel attacked. But not like the person that they run their tank all the way to E and then they go and put five bucks in. And then no, they I run up, they, they go put five bucks. Well, so everyone's well, got their different means of, of how they fill their tank, right? So so sometimes whether it be you know physical gas tank, but I'm saying like even in life, sometimes you have to give it a little bit more. But if you're constantly running on E and you're constantly really like pushing yourself to the limit, something has to give. You need to have a self-realization on why you're getting to that E point, why you're getting to the empty. Why are you running on empty? There's got to be something that you can change that you don't have to get to that quarter tank, eighth tank, and then all of a sudden your gas light is turning on and you just don't want to get out of bed. That's that's my big takeaway. If Lola isn't already paying for this, I would pay for this. You you are yeah you are yes yeah, Patreon. <laughs> but I would if I wasn't. <laughs> Thank you. My point is is that I look at this and I think that there's something that you can do. There are trigger points where you realize that in life that if you are constantly feeling like you're running on empty. You have to have a self-realization or hopefully someone around you that you've surrounded yourself with that says, hey, pump the brakes or let off the gas a little bit that you can actually get to this point where at the very most, let's do baby steps. You're not running on empty anymore. You're running on a quarter tank. You need a good night's sleep. Yeah. So so take, take this weekend off. Yeah. Whatever you got to do. At some point before you crash, Take control of it so that you don't get to that point. I know I still get to that point. I know you guys probably still get to that point. As you guys get back on the road, as, as everyone gets back to what they call normal, right. all these old habits are going to come back into place. So so my closing remarks is, is that you get to the point where you don't, you don't get to that E. You can have a self-assessment of your life that you have a gas gauge that as soon as you get to that quarter tank, you start getting those, those that you get that red light on there. You're like, I'm getting to my wits end. I'm getting, I don't feel like myself. I feel like I'm going to get to that point where I don't want to do anything. So before I do that, I need, I need an hour. I need to be able to step back or I need to be with my wife. I need to have a, like you guys on the road, I need an hour FaceTime or whatever, like video chat. I'm going to step away. I'm going to go back to my hotel room. It's not the same for everyone, but there's something. There's there's a recentering of something that you guys bring yourself back to refuel your tank so you don't have to run on empty. And it's different for everyone, whether it's exhaustion, whether it's putting yourself out there for other people all the time before you, you always put yourself last. Something has to give to a point that you see this coming and you learn from it. And that's where I feel like we you, you hope my hope is to anyone out there listening to this is that you never run on empty again. You never push yourself beyond what you know you can do, because when you do that, you are not yourself anymore. And there are consequences to that, not only yeah. to your mental health, your physical health, but the people around you. And that's when shit hits the fan. So fill your tank up with the people that you love, the people that support you. And first and foremost, you have to support and love yourself and fill your own tank. That's my closing remarks. Beautiful, Steve. Steve, I, 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 I'm, Steve I'm starting to get the impression that uh, you had a conversation with my girlfriend before we had this podcast. <laughs> no. I've never I'm, met her, but I, she's a great girl. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm telling you because I learned that the hard way. I can. I'm, I'm sure I've got a text message now that was like, I don't know who this Steve guy is, but you need to fucking listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully she, she tunes in for weeks to come. <laughs> I, oh man! Oh, I'm telling you. So the next yes. podcast we do, we're in the garage. I'd love to do that. I would love to do that. Absolutely. Hopefully, yes, yes. We do it with me and Justin. I'm going to meet him there. He'll meet me there. Yeah. We're doing Absolutely. it. And I'm actually, we, you know, it's a whole other episode, but I actually, uh, I worked in Columbus for uh, for about three months at, in between uh, ventures there. So I'm uh, I'm familiar with the uh, with the area. So we'll, we'll definitely have to come down and, and 
and uh, hang out. You're always welcome. Guys, thank you very much. Thanks to our sponsors, Tinderbox at Easton, Alternates USA, BS Cigar Company, and also you guys at patreon.com slash bourbon BS podcast. Thank you very much. Check that out. Thank you, guys. Justin, Jonathan, thank you for tuning in from, from Texas. Guys, happy Whiskey Wednesday. Share, like, review, and enjoy it. See you guys next week. All right, I'll move on. Sit bar box, right? Sorry.